actions to report from the closed session. So Holly, if you go ahead and take the roll. Okay. Director Ferris? Here. Director Falls? Here. Director Moran? Present. President Swan? Here. Director Henry? Here. Uh, well, you're seeing pretty busy over there, but are there any additions or deletions to the uh, open session agenda? Uh, I have none. Okay. At this time we'll have the uh, oral communications. Anybody wishing to speak on something not included in the agenda for tonight may so speak. Nobody. Okay. Sound check okay over there? All right. Uh, okay, moving on to unfinished business. Item 10A. Okay, uh, item 10A is we are kicking off today the, the new district website. We are in transition of getting it to come up when you log in. I'll turn to Stephanie and let her give a, just a real quick overview. We're not going to really get into it, but our new website is very close to up and running. We are in transition. Yeah, so I guess, I don't know all the technical terms, but I guess when they switch over the DNS, DNS. it takes sometimes about 48 hours for it to transition off of what it was to what it is now. Um, so hopefully, you know, by this weekend that'll be occurring. But in general, this is the new district website. It's got some nice quick button features for some of the most common things that people go to. It's got the drop downs to get you to some of the other different key areas. There's now a district spotlight section. So this is where whatever the most current news is will be filtering through. You can go and click to see, you know, view all news so you can get a full directory of everything. The district's Facebook link, calendar, link to local weather. Um, similar to the old website, you know, we have some quick links down below that you can get to. Um, but in general, we encourage people to definitely go and, you know, check it out. Uh, some of the cool new features can put a little bit more control in the individual's hand. Uh, so notify me. So this is where customers can go and enter in your email address and you can sign up to get alerts for when an agenda's been posted, when the minutes for that agenda's been posted, and then that way you can kind of go in and subscribe or unsubscribe yourself from as much or as little information as you want to receive directly. I was just going to note that I'm going to send an email out to all of the people on my agenda list to let them know about the, the link to this so that they will not miss out on any agendas that are coming up. We encourage people to go and check it out. Uh, yeah. yeah. Nice and cool. So, that's cool about it. Congratulations, uh, Stephanie. Mm -hmm. Great job <coughs> getting all that together. Uh, I, I do want to say a lot of work and effort went into the design and the implementation of the website project by the, uh, the, the Director of Finance and Business Services, Stephanie Hill. Stephanie Hill, she has to be commended for her effort in, in heading up this process. She kept the department heads moving on track, getting our sections done, and put a lot of extra time into this project. Yeah, that's obvious. Well, yes. Yeah, if anybody's been involved in a website migration, um, it is it is a lot of work. This was even more work because of the age of the technology that is currently being used on our old website. So um, the, the staff has done just a phenomenal job here. This moved along in about six, seven, eight months, somewhere in that time period. Uh, it was about a year ago that we actually approved going forward in this, and it, it, by the time you get the contracts done and all that, it's about it's seven or eight months of implementation. This is lightning speed for this kind of a heavy lift moving from where we were to now. And we're hopeful that this has um, really good benefits for our community in terms of being able to stay in touch with us, get information about what's happening. Um, you guys did a great job. Congratulations. Okay, champagne. Oh, you oh. broke it. <laughs> you broke the bottle. I broke the bottle. <laughs> yes. Sure. Public? Any comments? 
Well done on the website. Yeah, bravo. Great <laughs> time. Bruce? Uh, thanks. I'm Bruce Holloway from Boulder Creek. Um, I just tried to take a look at SOBWD.com um, like I have for years. And um, I've got an iPhone, so it says Safari cannot open the page because too many redirects occurred. It's in the transition, so they may be, I mean... So, so Bruce, the, the DNS servers, so when you move from one IP address to another, it takes about 48 hours for that to happen, and we're in the middle of that right now. So you're going to get some weird messages while that transition is occurring. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay, but and then the other thing I was going to say was, uh, before I left the house, uh, I was trying also to look for packet, and I had, it wanted me to install something. Yeah. Um, so it started down an install pathway, and uh, anyway, yeah, uh, I, 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 uh, I'm confused. Uh, give it some time. Yeah, give it a little bit of time. I think certainly that was the same. Any other comments? Okay, moving, uh, moving along. Item 10B. Yes, item 10B is a swim tanks replacement and potential acquisition uh, of the uh, Nakari property located on uh, Dundee Avenue in Ben Loman. This is APN 078-233-05. We have, staff has two reports where we're going to do into a PowerPoint, if I can get it to fit on the page, and then we have uh, the written report that's in your agenda packet. Uh, uh, the, the board appointed uh, uh, property negotiators, uh, the district manager, and district council. So the district council and myself will be uh, giving this uh, report. Um, I'll start with the, uh, the actual uh, PowerPoint. I hope that will somewhat fit. Is the, is the existing swim tanks uh, location. We have two redwood tanks at this location. Um, it's a 96, the lower one I do believe is the 9600 gallon tank and the upper one that you can kind of see directly behind the lower one is 10,000 gallons. As you can see they're located right off of is that Country Club in Dundee or is it just Country Club in, in, in Woodland. Woodland. Okay. This is the existing location. Again, this is the upper tank. This is where the district's uh, current project of uh, reconstruction of the tank would be. That tank would be removed. Those redwood trees would uh, be removed. Um, there would be significant grading, and a new tank would go at that location. That's the lower tank. You can see on, uh, that, that it's on silts because of the steep topography. Uh, this is the tank that the district some years ago lined that was leaking pretty bad. And we went in there with a, uh, like a hypalon line, liner and lined the tank. And Rick, when you do that, that um, stops the leaks, but does that It stops the leaks, but also the starts the decay process, starts dry rot and so forth. And there may even be a slight little lean to that tank since we put that liner in, showing signs that it's reaching its, its life expectancy. Um, that's for sure. It, it, it normally is anywhere from five to seven years, and you're going to want to uh, replace the tank. It's short lived. These are the, the construction plans to stay at our existing site, is what you can see there uh, the grade. Uh, the tank, um, there's a series of retaining walls that go in. Uh, there's a, a large uh, flight of stairs that go up from uh, Woodland, Country Club area, up to the tank and pump station. Uh, this, uh, these are the plans that we actually went out to bid for a couple years back. 
another set of the construction plans would show the, uh, the tree removal um, and, 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 and grubbing and cleaning of the site, a considerable amount of tree removal and grading. And then these uh, is the design of the, uh, the new retaining wall structure. There would be 13 foot retaining walls on three sides of the new tank at that existing uh, tank site. Uh, pretty extensive uh, retaining wall uh, system uh, for that tank. And that also limits the size of the tank that we could put there um, just because of the topography and the steep drop off into a uh, drainage channel on one side of that tank. How many gallons do that? I do believe that's a 64,000 gallon tank right there. Now this is the, the property that we're talking about tonight. It's the Nakari property. Its size is roughly 6,534 square feet. Um, that is the proposed tank location and the parcel that we've been in negotiations with Mr. Nakari. You can see, somewhat see, that the tank site is relatively flat compared to the other tank site. And this is standing on the road looking directly onto the property. Um, so it's pretty much right off the roadway, pretty flat, doesn't have the steep gradient, doesn't have the requirement to uh, remove the uh, six or 700 yards of, of material, uh, doesn't have the requirement to build those massive retaining walls. This is looking at, again at the Nakari property at a grove of redwood trees that we'll talk about more um, throughout the proposal. Um, these trees are, uh, uh, would plan to be left in place and we would have a project arborist on site during any type of construction activities if we were to move ahead on this location. Here's a uh, the site plan, just a, a drawing, our, in, our engineer survey drawing of the Kari property showing the trees, showing the rough location of the tank. I'm not sure that's the exact size of the tank. Uh, it's pretty close, um, but that was reused that just to place the, uh, uh, to show us the placement of the tank on the property. And how big, how many gallons would that be? I think that's the same as the other swim tank, 64,000, but we would want to put bigger in. Um, that was just put on as a placeholder. Um, how big do you think we would go? I'd like to go uh, up to the, the 100, 120,000 gallons if we, if we could uh, fit it on the parcel. We haven't laid out the actual tank and pump station yet. Um, the two sites side by side, uh, the district existing site on your left, I'm sorry we don't have a better uh, uh, centered on the, on the screen. Uh, you see the site on the left are our two existing redwood tanks and you look at on the right is the Nakari site. You can see the, the sites are, are very different, one is very steep, one is very flat. The existing site and the Nakari site um, uh, comparison, the existing site, we have limited water storage. Uh, we have a removal of nine redwood and oak trees. We have a steep, very steep embankment, a 34-foot stairway going up to the tank site. We have concrete retaining walls, 13 feet tall on all three sides. We're excavating approximately 825 cubic yards of material to put in a, a tank pad to construct the new tank. Uh, we have extensive erosion control because of the retaining walls and grading. We have increased construction costs with the, the retaining walls and the, the, the grading. And we have a greater, much greater environmental impacts with the grading and the tree removal, etc. When you look at the Nakari site, uh, we have uh, increased storage for fire flow. We have minor hardwood tree removal. We're not removing uh, the redwoods. Uh, the tank site is relatively flat. We have maybe some small minor retaining walls on the back side of the parcel. Uh, minimum uh, excavation, uh, minimal erosion control. Uh, we have reduced construction costs and we have minimal environmental impacts. But keep in mind we have not done sequel review, so not unless we compared the environmental impacts to the existing site, those are you know, basically a stone's throw away. So we don't anticipate red-legged frog, we don't anticipate June beetle, um, some of the more uh, uh, problematic issues. 
So we get into the uh, alternatives now, and Gina, do you want to uh, speak about the alternatives? Sure. Did you want to take questions from the board before I get sure. this? Sure. However you would like to proceed. If the, does the board have any questions at this point from the, from the slides? And I, again, apologize, I'm not on the screen. I'm not, I don't get it, but we were today. So, does the board have any questions at this time? No. Okay. Well, that uh, so I'm as co-negotiator with the district manager for this property acquisition. I'm going to provide just a brief recap of what's happened uh, with the negotiation process and what the alternatives are going forward. Um, there were a number of communications, mostly between, I think, Mr. Nakari and the district manager related to the property. Uh, I was brought in uh, as co-negotiator at some point in the fall. We met with Mr. Nakari. These efforts culminated in an offer letter to Mr. Nakari um, as a, that was sent on January 30th. A copy of that is in the agenda packet as, agenda, as attachment F. Um, the district received no response to that offer letter before it expired. After it expired, the district received a letter from Mr. Nakari indicating that he was no longer interested in selling the property to the district. Um, at about the time this agenda packet was being finalized, the district manager received a call from Mr. Nakari uh, re-engaging in negotiations. Uh, there were discussions of prices, eight, 85000 uh, was proposed, and then I, I believe that was increased back up to 90000 Then we received, uh, right after the agenda packet went out, a written, we requested during that call a written response to the offer letter that had been sent on January 30th, and we received back a written offer um, seeking $88,000 um, down from the $90,000 that, that had previously been requested and requests for a number of non-monetary terms. And copies of that letter have been provided to the board and they were placed, uh, they may have already been picked up by folks in the audience. If there are people in the audience who are interested, please share them. Um, so we have Mr. Nakari's uh, counteroffer that he provided on Friday after the uh, board packet went out. And we also have a draft um, responding offer that's been provided uh, to the board members and to the public if they want to take a look at it that was prepared after the agenda packet uh, deadline. So uh, I, I just want to present a few different alternatives that the board could choose to pursue going forward. Um, the first alter yes. Before we go, there, did we talk about the appraisal that we had? done? Is that going to be covered in the next section? Well, it is in the board packet. Um, could we? Yeah, we could talk about that. Uh, yeah, we'll, I, if, let me go through the three alternatives and go into the, the deeper into the material. And the yeah, I, I mean, I get that it's in the packet, but not everybody has a packet. Mm -hmm. And also mm -hmm. for the mm -hmm. community TV, I think it would be worthwhile to go through some of the numbers. Okay. Um, well, the, so the appraisal was done over the summer, and the appraised amount of the property is $9,500. Um, yeah, that is the fair market va value according to the, the property appraiser that the district retains to take a look at the site. Which was Frank Mann, right. Right. Yeah. who's done a lot of work in the area. That's correct. Frank Mann is an appraiser that's been in, done work in the valley and for quite some time. The district used him before. Yeah. Certified, obviously, appraiser. Uh, and he did the comps, and, and in the packet there is a, uh, a full appraisal, property appraisal with comps and so forth uh, in your packet. And just for full disclosure, about 25 years ago, my wife worked for Frank May for a brief period of time. So it's been a while. Well, maybe I should get into the alternatives from here. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, uh, 
Okay, so the first alternative that we presented the, to the board for consideration tonight is to continue with the efforts that have now been ongoing for about six months uh, to acquire the lot via negotiated sale. Um, as it states in the agenda packet, as you can see in attachment F, the last written offer to Mr. Nakari was for $75,000 um, with a number of other terms that were based on a, a combo of the district's consideration of Mr. Nakari's concerns and what the district was prepared to do uh, in connection with the sale of the property. Um, I think it's fair to say the district feels like, uh, or at least we as the district's negotiators feel like we're at a crossroads here. The price is getting quite high, um, and we still haven't reached an agreement on the non-monetary terms. And so, you know, we're finding ourselves in an impasse situation. Um, that said, continuing with efforts to acquire the land via negotiated sales, the pros of that are that, you know, clearly a negotiated sale would maximize the benefits to both parties. The cons are what I just said, um, that the efforts to date have been unsuccessful. Uh, it's unclear whether an agreement can be reached. Um, and uh, the last sentence here in the board packet that we haven't received a written a counter offer that clarifies the seller's non monetary demands. Um, that, of course, is now out of date. We did receive a written offer, it has been passed out, but uh, there continues to be a lack of agreement on the non monetary terms. Uh, the second alternative presented for the board's consideration is to initiate steps to acquire the lot via eminent domain. Um, I think folks have, have a pretty good idea of what this is, but this is the legal power of a public agency like the district to acquire property for public use by paying the owner just compensation based on its fair market value. Um, the amount of just compensation can be set based on negotiation or if necessary by litigation. Um, this approach uh, very likely would result in a lower acquisition cost to the district and importantly unencumbered title um, and it would move the process forward. Um, we may never be able to negotiate a a purchase uh, on terms acceptable to the district, and so this would provide another way to proceed. The cons of eminent domain, of course, are high transaction costs. Um, the district would incur legal fees. Uh, best guess, you know, in the order of tens of thousands of dollars. Um, and the district would have to pay costs, such as the owner's cost to obtain an appraisal up to $5,000. Uh, it involves a number of steps. Um, it, you know, it won't be done right away. It is dependent on envir completing the environmental review process, as all, are, are all of these alternatives. The third alternative presented for the board's consideration is to re-solicit construction bids for the existing swim tank site. And uh, do you want to address that one? Yeah, we don't, we don't believe that that is a good alternative to go back to the old site given the amount of work that we've done and determined that the Nakari site meets and exceeds the needs of the district and we can increase uh, uh, storage um, and it's a much better site all the way around. It's a lot less environmentally uh, um, intrusive to, uh, to the neighborhood. You know, there's no tr very few trees to come down versus the, the, the large amount of redwood trees on the on uh, the existing site and the steep topography and the amount of work. And there is a cost savings uh, by going to the Nakara site as well. <coughs> what were the numbers on the existing site that we had estimated and where the bids came in? And that's what we mm -hmm. put, put uh, I don't have those numbers in there. There's an estimate about savings of probably close to 300,000. Okay. Um, we do have a main extension to put in to get up to the, the new tank site. Um, there is, you know, a significant savings to the district. And the original bid was sort of like a million and a half, one I think. Point four. One point, yeah. And the original estimate from the engineer was about a half a million? Somewhere yeah, yeah correct. So, I mean, good news about good economy is it's a good economy. The bad news is the builders are all busy. <coughs> That's correct. And it is a, the, the, the existing site is a difficult construction site. It's a difficult area to work. Especially when you're moving that kind of material, a large yardage, you have to, you know, it's smaller vehicles, smaller trucks, one lane roads, flying corners. I mean, there's more impact on the community. There's much more impact on the community on that other side, on that existing side. Uh, that's correct. 
I mean, one of the difficulties in putting exact dollars and cents on all of these things, as you're well aware, is that um, you know the engineering isn't complete on the new site. It hasn't been bid. Environmental review isn't complete. So it's hard to, to really pin it down. Uh, eminent domain also, you know, that there are uncertainties in that process in terms of how much it would cost. Um, but um, given your experience, your firm's experience in it, though, sort of what's kind of a minimum number on eminent domain? A minimum would be um, in the ten to fifty thousand dollar range. What about from a time perspective? Um, well, it's, it's it's hard to say exactly. I mean. If we could reach a negotiated deal, that would be faster than eminent domain. But if we can't reach a negotiated deal, you know, eminent domain will move it forward in a matter of you know, some months. Of course, you've got to complete environmental review either way, so that adds time um, before you can you know, either close on an agreement or uh, complete an eminent domain acquisition. So that's the environmental review may be one of the most significant factors, time factors either way. Uh, but uh, I think it's fair to say one of the district's concerns with some of the terms that are proposed on the offer that's being negotiated is that they would create some constraints for environmental review and engineering that would be... That's correct. Yeah. Um, um, what, 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 uh, what do you do? Well, the last, the last letter from Mr. Carr had further setbacks from property corners that he wanted facilities, less storage, a smaller tank, was, uh, fencing, a reduced amount of fencing that was to the point that where it would impact maintenance and it would cause issues down the road. Um, we could we came to agreement on, on some vegetation planting, um, some of the the tree requests from the Project Arborists were excessive. Most everything that we put in um, was best management practices. Full road overlay where we believe that we follow the county spec on the road overlay. That's pave pave pavement, right, on the <coughs> trench lines. We could do a trench and slurry cover. Um, and then the last the last letter from Mr. Carr had a, an additional that we didn't discuss before about the fencing and setbacks from our pump station 12 feet from the property line. It was getting to the point that we're, we didn't have room on the parcel to do everything we needed to do. I mean, um, we do have a recommendation, staff does have a recommendation that um, the next slide that I think that I, I would like to, to have the board consider that the board direct the negotiators to make a, a last, best, and final written offer, which is alternative one, and for the direct staff, um, if not acceptable, uh, to proceed with alternative two, which would be intimate domain. Now, the highlights of the purchase offer that we would like to move ahead with would be a purchase price of 88000 a project arborist uh, construction impact assessment and tree protection plan, um, a wildlife-friendly vegetation, uh, nut and fruit <coughs> trees and berry bushes, uh, fencing would be minimal around the tank, but it, it couldn't be, it would be eight feet out from uh, from the tank. Uh, an owl nesting box is part of our, our, our rodent control. Um, the pump station enclosure would be a split face cement block, fire resistant roof. Uh, the trench line, roadway paving, uh, the County of Santa Cruz design, which is you know best management practices. And how and much of the road would be paved? It would be the trench, line, the trench line or anything we damaged and then a slurry seal over the entire roadway, very common in, in the county, and then the sequel review. Um, we feel that this parcel would much better fit the needs of the district. Um, it is much more than the appraised value, but it has a, a construction value to the district. Um, to, to pass this tank site up at this point, um, would not be recommended by staff. Um, we've done all the, the preliminary work and we feel that this is the best location to relocate the tank. We can put more storage up on this parcel. Um, we can get closer to, to fire flows. Uh, you know, we just don't have the, fire, the room to put the fire flows in at the lower tank. When we replace the tank, we try to put it in at today's standards. It's important to us that we don't go back 
And sometimes we can't do that. Sometimes we're limited on space like we are now at the uh, existing swim tank site. We just couldn't cut into that bank any further because we were either off our property or we were over into the drainage ditches. Uh, it wasn't constructible. So we had to go with what we could fit on that other parcel. Um, you know, I, I, I don't want to encumber today's <laughs> operations and future operations with setbacks and, and requirements on fencing and so forth. You know, we have no other plans but to, to install a tank and a pump station. Uh, but I don't want to encumber uh, changes if we change things around or something uh, needs to be done with the pump station. The setbacks I can't live with. Uh, fencing, we need room to get in and maintain our tank, paintings, coatings. We need to keep vegetation away from our tanks. Vegetation close to our tanks brings rodents, climb on the tanks, and when rodents get on tanks, they start to chew, they cause issues. It's a, it's a cleanliness. Um, we do a fencing that uh, is, we try to be architecturally sensitive uh, and put you know, a, a redwood type fence on the side where people could see it. There's not a lot of visual on this site because it is kind of a bowl. It is surrounded, has a lot of redwood trees and it kind of sits in a bowl. There's not a lot of visual impacts from this tank. Um, staff recommending that we move ahead with our last and final offer. Now we have a lot more information that we can go through in the staff report and obviously we'll answer your questions. I'd much rather I'd like to answer the board's questions before we go to Nick. Um, but I imagine Nick will want to address the board. The then the Carters are here tonight and I don't know if Gina has any more that she would like to add to this or do we want to go to the staff report? Lewis is burning your pants right now so she's got a question. Okay. I don't really have a question. Oh, I just joking? I, I I'm not joking. No, I I feel like eighty-eight thousand. I could live with that, but none of the other items he wants. They're that's up to us. We need to have a bigger tank for fire flow. Uh, we need to be able to get to the tank. Uh, there are so many reasons to have the tank there, and I, and I would be willing to go 88,000, but I would not ever agree to all his stipulations. Bottom line. So I don't have a question. I just had a statement. Any other board uh, questions? I don't have any questions about this time. Mm -hmm. Gina, did you want to add uh, something? No, thank you. I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay, I don't think we have any questions right now. Then. So, time to hear from the public. Yeah, Mr. Nakari, would you like to yeah. share your thoughts? <coughs> yes. And I hope that you guys maybe give me a little bit more than five minutes if yes. it's necessary. <coughs> and then no we problem. can engage in back and forth if it's possible. Is that okay? Or do you, uh, you can't respond to anything I say or give any answers to my questions? Um, just we'll see what we can do. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that sounds fair. If we can. So, to tell you the truth, I'm not sure, Rick, you had said a couple times that, you know, uh, you wouldn't want to be hindered by any stipulations that you agreed to as far as various items other than the price. And I wonder, I mean, when we make a contract, what guarantees do I have that you're not going to go back on your word and say, well, that's what we thought before, but now we think this. And once you own it, you know I can't do anything about that. What guarantees do I have that you will stick to various parts of the agreement? without adding changes. Probably none is what I see right now. I'd have to refer to counsel on that thing. Yeah, I mean, the main cons constraints on what the district can do with the site, if they get it in fee simple without encumbrances or restrictions, would be environmental review and engineering. I, could I ask him a question? Sure, why not? So, if you bought a piece of property from someone, would you want them to be able to tell you what you could do with that property after you bought it? Well, Lois, there are plenty of laws that prevent people from doing certain things. Those are laws. That We're isn't talking my about question. Agreement. That isn't my question. No, I wouldn't want that. You're right. However, if a water tank was being put right across <clears> the street from your house, wouldn't you want some guarantees? That's my counter question. Isn't that true? Would you? Would you? I would want a tank that provided sufficient, safe, 
quality water and water for fire flow. I think that's what I would want. Okay. My neighbors here and I would all like that. What I was talking about in this is, well, first of all, I just want to say that the appraiser you had that appraised it at $10,000 is for a non-buildable site. So are you saying that for that $10,000, which you think is a fair price at first, that you wouldn't build on the site and keep it non-buildable? I don't think you can build I, on it. It's I, not I, no, I, I can't build on it, but you can, so it's buildable for the district. Okay. And I have an appraiser that says that he thinks that he can find the, the appropriate comps and this guy is a commercial appraiser, extremely experienced. He's done for Big Creek and everything. This guy's not your typical appraiser like Frank May. And he says that, yes, it's worth a lot more than an unbuildable lot because the district has the right to build on it presently. Even. So uh, as far as the appraisal, that's, that, that could go over $100,000 easily. Well, you have never hired him. No, I haven't. But he's in line to be hired as the second appraiser, which I'm entitled to by law. So, uh, the closest well, the trees to the second, street. Now. I'm talking about making. <coughs> no, no, no. Excuse me. When you say you're entitled to a appraisal by law, you can actually get an appraisal done at any time. That's okay. my understanding yeah. right now. If, I, if I it went into an eminent domain process, mm -hmm. then then there's a, a, a process for when, when that happens. Right. But but I think you could have gotten an appraisal done any time in the last six months. Right? Yeah, and I didn't because I'd rather negotiate directly with this board, who I. Support. Well, I have supported, and I, I think we got a really good board in general. And I would rather n not go into all these extrapolated possibilities. So, I mean, if the time comes and I have to do that, I will. Um, I'm, my other things, other than the price, is basically we live in a neighborhood, and you folks all live in a neighborhood. I want to maintain the integrity of the neighborhood. We live in a beautiful natural environment. I want to maintain the integrity of that. We live in a peaceful area. Why can't the pump station be a little bit further away from the road so that it wouldn't have a negative impact? I'm talking about preventing negative impacts to our neighborhood. The tank size doesn't have to be 120 to be bigger than a 64 gallon. It's going to be really tall, and I don't see how you can fit it with 30 foot wide base and then two times eight feet, right? Because it's going to be eight feet on either side of it. So that's 16 feet. So you've got 46 feet. Mr. Parker here is on the side that has a 50 foot long side. I mean, that's putting it like three feet from either side of the property line and right up against his property. And it's also closer to the Redwoods than a highly skilled arborist who, who I had consultations with. And I sent a copy of it to Rick. And I'm sure many other arborists would agree, except for maybe the one the district hires, <laughs> that it needs to be 15 feet away at least to minimize the, the probability of damaging one redwood tree or two, and then that goes through the root system, and then you've got a really major problem of taking out redwoods after you put in a tank that are right next to the tank, and it messes up the neighborhood look, and it messes up the neighborhood noise, having the pump station. It's going to be months of construction. Can I ask how long this would really take? How long do your other tanks take to build, generally? They're all different. I, we've estimated this one out there on three months, and the minute we, from the day we broke ground, there's a lot to do yet, <coughs> and with CEQA and this type of thing. And there's two parts of this. There's the tank, and then there's the main line. Uh, the tank and main line, I think we could do in a three month. We can do the main line and tank almost simultaneously. Um, it's not a big project um, for this piece of property because you don't have the massive grading, you don't have the massive retaining walls, um, and you don't have the massive tree work. And does this tank come in in one piece? The tank comes in in, in in sheets and it bolts together. The tank goes up in roughly two and a half to three days from the ground up. Uh, it's very quick on the tanks. What takes the longest would be the site work and the foundation, the ring wall foundation, and the tank goes up <coughs> overnight just about. Can I ask a question on the board? If you wanted a tank, if the tank was going to go across the street from you, that's going to lower your property value and the property values of the neighbors if it's too big. If it's not too big, it's a benefit to the neighborhood. Well, if I it's think too small, it lowers. I mean, you have 
fire flow issues and you don't have fire flow in the neighborhood. Rick, this isn't going to stop a fire. A fire is going to happen, yeah. and this will be there if the fire truck comes up. And you think 120,000 gallons versus 80,000 gallons is going to put a fire out on the side of a mountain? I don't think so. Yeah. But you got to consider, we got to live with that every day. And I really regret even offering, when you called and asked me if I would still consider that, I should have said no right out, really. I wish this whole thing had never happened, because then I could be at peace. And I am not at peace. My neighbors are not at peace now. You guys are bringing harm to our neighborhood in a way by making too, you're trying to put too big of a tank on too small of a parcel for it. And that's my feeling. And as far as the road, yes, I agree. I, I agree. And I'm glad that you have agreed to, to cover the whole road surface where you damage it. I think that's fair. You, you, you damage your friend's property, you, you, you take care of things in it. But, and, and as far as the environment, you know, we all keep taking from the environment. I don't want this thing to look like a skyscraper in the middle of our neighborhood. You're talking about 24 feet tall? That is too tall for that site, and 30 feet is too wide. I'm not against water storage, I think you know that, but appropriately. That's my feeling, and I think most of my neighbors, or all of my neighbors probably feel that way, and I respect my neighbors, I try to respect them, and I care about our neighborhood. So I don't want to see this harm our neighborhood. That's what I'm asking the board. I'm all for getting more water up there. I think most of us are. But it, this isn't going to stop a fire. This might be a response to a fire of 10,000 gallons, 20,000 gallons. It makes no difference to that when you've got such a large tank. You've got to get out pretty quick. I'm asking the board to be considerate of the neighborhood, to be considerate of the environment, and to stick to your word. Because too many times I've heard that dealing with this water board, and it's a new director, so it might be a little different. If you're dealing with the water board, you better get it in writing. And even then, you don't have a guarantee. And Lois, you had to deal with, with the Long Pico water board messing up your road, right? Didn't they tell you in advance they were going to mess it up? The Long Pico water board messed up my road? That's what I heard, that you had an issue with the water well, board. Oh, road. yeah. The, a line broke and drained all the water out of Long Pico. Drained all the water out. Yes, uh, that happened. I thought it was but, about the road, I might be wrong. It was what? I thought it was about the road, but I might be wrong. Well, it undermined the road. Right. And the road got fixed, and there's a nice bridge. And And that's the way it should be. And yeah. that's all I'm asking the water district to care about our road that much. And I think you can understand the importance of that. To your well, neighborhood. our road was not drivable. Your road. We're not talking about making your road undrivable. It will be for the months that you're doing it because it's a one-lane road with so much more traffic than was there just several years ago. Lois, please be considerate of our neighborhood. That's all I'm asking. You know what? I feel like, well, I'm not going to say what I feel like. Well, I'm sorry I, to hear that, Lois. I really am because what I'm asking is to please be considerate of our neighborhood and you take that negatively? No, I don't make, take that negatively. Okay. I think it would be a good thing for your neighborhood. I agree. That we're I water. really think it would be a wonderful thing, and to have more water instead of what sixty-four gallons, sixty-four gallons. Sixty-four thousand. Six. I'm sorry. Sixty-four thousand gallons. A hundred and twenty is almost double. Right. The amount of water, and I think it would be better for your neighborhood, and we're going to have. More and more PG&E uh, issues and water problems. When PG&E turns the water off, it would really help if you had more storage there. I agree. With um, the PG &E. That's but, all. But I, look, Lois, yeah. let's say that there's an appropriate lot for a house, right? But do you think in a neighborhood like ours, where they're all fairly small houses, that it's appropriate to put in a 30-foot wide house that's 24 feet tall? Probably the county wouldn't permit that because it's not appropriate for the location. I'm not against more water, and I don't think my neighbors are. What we are against is something inappropriately large for our neighborhood. I hope that the board can understand that with compassion and caring for our neighborhood. That we don't want to see our home values go down because there's some massive big tank right there. We do want to see, well, you, you just made a smirk, but you know, you have a house with value probably. And you own it. Now, for me to sell that and then watch my house's value go down, I could probably, when I sell my house, get many more thousands of dollars by having that lot across the street for sale with it. 
once you put the tank in, my house value goes down and I don't have that benefit. So you're making an assumption. Um, there are already assumptions being made here. Where is the lot in relation to your house? Is it right across the street? Across street? Not directly. It's, I'm directly across from Peter Parker here, and it's the next lot up. So, I mean, if there was ever an earthquake that caused it to, to buckle in some way or slip off its foundation, that would probably kill my family. That amount of water coming down on us. So there is a risk to it, but it's not a big one. But it is a risk. And so I am asking the district, please be considerate of our neighborhood and to lower the size of the tank. If you don't want to have the restriction on you, then be considered enough to, to, to offer a smaller tank that's more appropriate. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. And I'm sure my neighbors agree with me on that. I care about the neighborhood. I've lived there for over 30 years, and many of them have too. We don't want to see it turn into a massive construction skyscraper-like tank there. I mean, that's an exaggeration. Do, we have any, do you have, have any renderings, or does anybody have any renderings of what this tank would look like, the tank you're envisioning on the property, so that you get some kind of a visual representation? Because it's one thing to say it's enormous right. and massive, and well, what does that really look like in real life? Well, the Richter Swan, uh, we know that on the side next to Mr. Parker's property, the property is about 50 feet long. And we know that 30 feet wide tank with an 8 foot fence around it comes out to 46. So that leaves two feet on either side from the property line. And I don't think that that's even, it shouldn't be legal because you got to have setbacks. But the fact is, is that you're trying to squeeze in a tank that's going to jeopardize the neighborhood's values. It's going to jeopardize the redwoods because 15 feet is the minimum away from it. It's going to be right up against other people's properties who probably don't appreciate that. And I'm just asking you to scale it back a little bit. So, yeah, we'll get more water. It's going to save you hundreds of thousands of dollars. Hundreds, several hundred thousand dollars. I'm offering something very beneficial to the district and just asking in return, since we have agreement on the price so far, that you come down again. The fact of the matter is, is that really, it's important to the neighborhoods. You got elected as caring about people. But, and I understand that you got to care about the, the water district, but if it's going in our neighborhood, please be considerate of our neighborhood. Scale it back a little bit, that way you don't say, I made a constraint. I think we're in agreement on, on the, the wildlife-friendly vegetation. We've reached agreement on the, uh, on the road. And we've reached agreement on the price. The size of the tank is the last big thing, in my opinion, that would be harmful to our neighborhood. 80,000 gallons, even a little bit more than 80,000 gallons, would still keep the neighborhood integrity better, stop the loss of valuation on our houses, and provide a lot of water to our neighborhood, much more than we have now, way more. And everybody wins on that. I mean, you said you want more water up there. I agree. These folks don't want to have a dry area. So that's my request. And, and I'm asking the district to please scale it back to where it's not butted up against my neighbor or right up in my face every time I drive there, that we don't have a noisy pump station right beside the road. Those are just, those, to me, those seem like decent things to do. And I ask the board to be decent in the way they treat our neighborhood. Please, are you going to make your decisions? Consider making it smaller, please. Thank you. Are there other uh, public comments regarding this issue? Anybody else? <coughs> yeah. Sorry, Dad. Chuck Wood from Ben Lohman. I live off Dundee Avenue. I have for 22 years. Um, basically, when I moved up there, I bought the house for the area that it's in. It's a beautiful area. It's like a little step away from everything. It's really with tons of redwoods all over. Anyway, your pictures you showed on your presentation you're pushing for the levelness of the property. What you're not showing is when you stand on Dundee and took that picture, there's a difference of about four and a half, five feet of a grade. So you'd have to do some retaining wall work in there. Um, it's a one lane road up there. Um, and you're talking about putting this massive tank up there. Right now when it rains, the water flows down Dundee like anything, like the center. It's good because it's a, it flows in the center and it goes all the way down the road. But right when we have the rain right now, that's a large area up there that the water soaks in. You're talking about putting a huge tank. Where does that water go? It's going to go down Dundee Avenue and cause more damage to our road than we currently have. Dundee is a private road. We maintain it. We pay for it ourselves. And 
um, the impact on that would be um, pretty great, I feel, with the water coming down. Um, the amount of trees, you're showing an entrance from Dundee Avenue. That's absolutely absurd because when you're out on Scenic Avenue, you can go in, there's a grove of trees that separate, you probably have like 12, 15 feet to go through the center there instead of using access from Dundee, which is a private road. Um, you'd have to, in order to enable parking and access from Dundee, you'd have to chew into your property more to give the people that live down that road driving room instead of having it so squished in. And as a result, um, you're chewing up more of your property for your tank. So yeah, all this stuff sounds good on paper, but we haven't seen anything really as far as what the plans are for the road, where the access to that is, um, you know, how we're going to deal with it. And also to a pump station, you have pumps running 24 hours a day, I'm assuming. And when you turn from Scenic onto Dundee, boom, you're going to be right there. I didn't buy that property up there for living next to a pump station. And I'm sure a lot of people would take that as a negative thing for our property values, too. And I'm not looking to score property values or anything, but I just don't want things taken away from us. We put a lot of, there's a lot of people in this room from Dundee here that put a lot of pride into their properties and put a lot of work into it. And just to have a mega thing put into the space, it doesn't seem to me that we have enough room to put this tank in. I'm not against it, but the size is ridiculous. And the concept of having pump motors running all the time. That's fine if it's away from residential houses. You're right in a residential neighborhood. <coughs> and I don't think anybody at this table would like that next to their property. Okay, I've said enough. And I haven't gotten myself in trouble. So. <laughs> no, you have. Not, not, not even close. <laughs> May I? Yeah. yeah please. I'm Kelly. I live down the street in Chuck. I mean, that, it sounds good. The, town, the tank sounds way large, way too large. But you've seen um, people use the two by fours in construction fencing to build a mock up of house sites, stuff like that. Is that a possibility? that you could do that on that property and see how large this tank's really going to be? To an extent, I don't know what, that. that's sort of like going along with like a rendering that I was asking. Yeah. If we could get an architectural rendering, you'd be able to see exactly what it would look like from several angles. I don't know if we can do that. Okay. Does it be an expense to it? There's an expense to everything. There is an expense to everything. <laughs> how about story poles? Yeah, yeah, you need a bunch. <laughs> I mean, it's... So, so are, are you a, a no on the tank in general, or just a no on the no, size? I, I like the tank. I, I think we need water, and I think those tanks down the hill are really crappy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and you were a no on the tank? <laughs> I'm okay or? with a tank, but I just feel what you're trying to squeeze in that area is not taking <clears throat> any consideration for the neighbors around. Right. You're going to plop this so, thing, and you're already just, talking about haven't. not doing fencing. I'm talking, please. Okay, you're not doing fencing as Nick was requesting and scaling back on those things. So I just want to have a little more control as far as what the people who live around there have to say right. as far as input in this. We haven't laid the tank sides out yet. Tank sides will have, the tank will have setbacks, it will have adequate fencing. We will not put some oversized tank on the property. But with we this have pump station, how noisy is it? Do they have a decibel number on it? They probably do. Yeah, of course they do. But it's in a block building. You should not be able to hear it. There's a pump going right now, and it's not Where in. Where are they going to put the lock building? You're already strapped on space for this tank. Well, well, we haven't laid out the site that tight yet. We haven't spent that kind of time and engineering costs to, to go in there and lay out. We know that we can fit a tank on the parcel. We know that it's geotechnically sound to fit the tank on the parcel. We had geotechnical work. It's in the uh, agenda. Drilling is done on the property. Um, we believe that we can have plenty of setback from the redwood trees, not touch that grove, um, and make this project work. Yeah, I, I don't think you will see some you know tank bulging out the sides of the parcel. How can we not? It's not a big parcel. Mm -hmm. yeah, could I, could I, you know, when you were talking, you talked about you live on a private road. You maintain the road. 
I'm in the same position in Long Pico. Mm -hmm. Live on a private road. We maintain that road. I have redwood trees all over my property. I, I, um, they're precious to me. Let me say it that way. One of the things that happened was because Lompico didn't have enough water, the state paid 100% grant for an inner tie with SLV. And the people in Ziani were pretty much up in arms about what you're talking about, a pump station and noise. There isn't noise. And you don't hear any complaints. Uh, that we went ahead, did all the work, pump stations there, it's quiet. Um, I, I understand your pain. And also, it, it's difficult <coughs> when the road is partially closed. Now, we have another way out, but it's a long way out. Um, and, yeah, you know, it, it, it's, I, I hear what you're saying. And it's not that I don't have any empathy with you, but I also feel like, that this would be a big benefit for you, and it would be a benefit for the district. Um, so. so, other comments? Anybody? Yeah. No, you, what, yes. What, what is that, Keller? Are you done? Are you, are you finished? Yeah. Oh. Uh, well, one more question. Um, when you're talking about the paving, are you talking about paving Dundee, the road next to it, or paving? Down the hill, down scenic, where you dig the trench, down to the. We're talking main. about. I said we haven't laid out the pump station. We definitely know that we will be putting a pipeline between the two tanks. Yeah, and yeah, you'll tie the, in down at the swim tank. Right? That's correct. Yeah. And so we will pave the, the trench line, repair the, the roadway, and slurry seal. Uh, we're not sure. I, I think the, the the last drawing I've seen or our, our, our original or our, our draft shows us coming right in, right off the cul-de-sac there, and not going down Dundee. Okay. Um, so I, if we don't dig up or just or, or damage the road, we will not be repaving. Okay. Fair enough. Yeah. But it hasn't been laid out that close yet. We've got some conceptual drawings that. Uh, we looked at just to see if this parcel will work. Uh, Bruce, you would second. Thanks. Um, I've got a couple of quick questions first. Um, is the lot on the corner? Yes. Okay. And, um, all right. Um, and how big is the I mean, this, this main you're talking about, it's only between the two tanks. That's correct. Uh, it's not going to go to the end of the street or anything like that. No. Um, how big is the pipe now? Two inch. Uh -huh. And some, some so a little bit there, it's not existing. Yeah. And you're going to put in six inch? Six inch. Uh huh. Um, when I. That, that's the minimum for fire flow. Right. right. Yeah. Sure. Um, when I. I was listening to the discussion earlier um, when Mr. Nakari was talking. Um, it, it almost sounded to me like um, there's been this negotiation over dollars that's gone on for months, basically, and now it, it almost sounded like a negotiation over gallons. Um, and it almost makes me want to say, hey, how about 88,000 gallons? Um, because it's in between what everybody seems to be saying. Um, now. I talked to Rick uh, a few days ago, and he was telling me that his goal was to always put 120,000 gallons in any neighborhood uh, because that was enough to, it was more or less enough to handle one structure fire. Um, I used to live across from Highlands Park down below, down by the highway, and there was a house fire on the park, which was right above my, where I was living. And I remember um, that uh, we ran out of water, 
I mean, everybody, neighbors all went out with hoses and they were trying to uh, keep the fire to this one house so it didn't spread anywhere. Um, and the fire department eventually came. And eventually we ran out of water. So, you know, there's less than 120,000. Maybe if there was 120,000, we would have had more water um, sooner. Most neighborhoods, I think, would probably like to have the, the extra amount for fire. Um, now, I was thinking about the difference between, I guess what you said was there before, 64,000 and 120. That's a little bit less than two times. And we're talking about volume here. So you really only need to have 25% more in each dimension to get close to two times the storage. So we're really talking about whatever it is, it's 25%. 25% in height, 25% more to get double or approximately double the volume, and 25% wider and deeper. So 25% is just seems like not really that much more. Um, now, the district manager also threw out a number of 100,000 gallons, um, which would be a little smaller. But anyway, I, I kind of think most neighborhoods would like to have the, uh, <coughs> the, 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 the fire amount, the, the greater amount for fire. And some of these other considerations, I guess I, I can see the district's point of view, that you just don't really know when you start to design this thing, you're going to find this or that problem. And you need to have some flexibility. You can't, you, you can't throw, you can't give up all of your flexibility upon the site before you even really start to plan it out. And so, you know, I, I just sort of hope that because there's a public process, I guess, and as this continues, there are going to be more board meetings to go over the environmental report to you know, look at whatever construction, you know, there's many, many steps down the road, and there's, so there's, and it's going to be a continuing public process, and there's continuing opportunity for public uh, input. So, anyway, I hope you guys can, uh, can strike a bargain. Thanks. Thanks for that mental rendering. <coughs> yes, more questions. Go ahead. Um, I'm, my name's Randy Gordon, I'm uh, also a resident of Dundee. Uh, I just am curious about the the road and where the road's going to be, I, I wasn't clear about where the road's going to be dug up and how, how that, what kind of impact that's going to have to our traffic up there. I don't know if anybody can elaborate. I'm pretty confused about that. That would be probably the biggest impact that the neighborhood will have when the main extension goes in. Because as we all know, it's a one lane road. You know, we do main extensions and main replacements all the time on one lane road. It's more costly. It's a lot more steel plates. We have to work with neighborhoods. We have neighborhood closures. We try to get in. We try to get out as soon as possible on the one lane road. Who would you estimate the the construction on the pipeline portion? Did we measure it up? We just over 500 feet. I think yes. we did. That's so yeah. probably a month. A month construction time on that. From okay. start to stop. And yeah. where is the pipeline? It's from the existing, below the existing redwood tanks that are on the hill there now, mm -hmm. to that lot. To the cul de sac, basically. So going up Country Club. Going up. Correct. That's correct. So you would have to basically tear up all of Country Club for that month to yeah. do that and work. Yeah, and we, we would do That's time. our only access in and out of that. that no, that's correct. correct. And we would 70 do some odd families. We would do time in, time out. Everybody would be notified of time in, time out. And then if there's like an emergency, then they do plating and plate it and let people out as need be. We work with the neighborhoods very closely. We work with neighborhoods on and I we, should hope. And we do we do these type of projects. <coughs> the San Jose Valley is full of one lane roads. And um, we work with the neighborhood. We do plating. We work with very closely with the fire districts so that they know when uh, the roads are going to be impacted. They know how to contact us if they need to, to get through. Um, there, and there's planned outages or planned closures. Um, there will be some inconvenience. Either project That's is only going, access. I, I totally understand that. that. Either that project. Seventy families live up Either that project is going to have um, 
traffic issues. You're looking at removing 700 yards of material and dump trucks from the existing site up and down the scenic. And it, both of these projects to, to bring in new water storage into that neighborhood are going to have construction um, traffic delays and, and issues during during construction. Uh, in, in my opinion, the old site, the one site we're on now, is going to be more intrusive and longer throughout with cement trucks and, and dump trucks, uh, tree work and all, than the other than the cart site. Uh, as for myself, Look, when we're done, you're going to have fire flow. Right now, if you go to build or add on to your house, you most likely would have to put in poly tanks uh, for the uh, for extra fire flow for your fire department under your permit. With the new tanks and fire hydrants go in, you do not have those requirements anymore. Requirements around the district. It's much better for your property and for your, your, your quality of life and living with fire flow all the way around. Grant you, there's going to be disruption during construction. Temporary. Temporary. Short lived. But the end result of having adequate fire flow and hydrants, a couple of fire hydrants along that stretch as well. We have a fire hydrant right down our street. Very little water behind that fire hydrant. <laughs> we still have a fire hydrant. Well, yeah. It's, uh, it's good as long as it has water to it. Yes. <laughs> Once the water's gone, the fire hydrant does you no good. It's a major improvement, especially with the PG&E outages. You see the amount of storage you have with those two small river tanks. That water then, it's pumped. That, that water in those two tanks serve all of Sina. We take the water out of there with that pump, pump it all the way to the top of that mountain, it's a very little bit of water for the scenic drive. It's one of our worst areas for water storage. The increased storage is very needed in that zone. Um, we finally got some halfway decent mainline size up there that we replaced years back with a six and four inch, but you don't have the storage. You don't have water storage. The pump will run on an average for about an hour and a half, two hours a day. Um, doesn't run 24-7. We strive to keep uh, noise to non-existent. We, the pump station that Director Henry talked about, had special sounding doors that were filled with concrete. And that was a large pump that we silenced. Special grill vents to, to silence uh, the vents. Um, they're expensive, but they work. And we go to those extra miles. We know that these, you know, these are your neighborhoods. We're not going to go out and put noise. We're trying to reduce noise and reduce our footprint and make it, you know, so you guys have adequate fire flow and water storage. Right now, during PG&E outages, we have to we have to monitor that very closely because you have such very little storage. We can lose it in a couple hours, and then the whole mountainside's out of water. Not just one little street. Once we lose that storage, there the whole mountainside is out of water. It's a very uh, inadequate water storage area. It's one of our worst. Um, I think as we go through this process, we can do more. Once we if we do move ahead, we will do more on sizing uh, to make sure that whenever we do fits on the parcel properly, that we're not hanging out over the edge or out in the street or infringing on someone's property. That's not our intent. <coughs> our intent is to protect that grove of trees. Um, I, I don't want, we have no intention on removing the grove of trees. We want to stay away from that grove. We would have a project arborist to, to work with us, certified arborist. We will do construction to best management practices, including the roadway. Um, we'll put it in, it's not a county road, but we, we we will use the county standard, which is you know, the best we have. We put it back into the county standards, even so it's not a county road. Um, we'll leave the road, you know, repair what we damage, and we will slurry seal the entire width of the road so we seal anything from cracks or any type of heavy equipment. And it'll look, it'll look good. It'll look, you won't see the scar when we do a slurry seal. I believe your name was Peter? Something? Yeah. Yeah. My name is uh, Peter Parker. 
uh, no relation to the other people. spiders? <laughs> Although we do occasionally get each other's phone calls. Um, so I live in Ben Lomond. My property is actually just north of the uh, where the proposed uh, tank site is. It's adjacent. <coughs> yeah, it's adjacent and to the north. So one of the questions that I have is I'm not sure where that tank is going. I'm not sure what 24 feet looks like. It's right up against uh, my property. So my property is probably the one that's going to be most directly impacted by it. I've looked at the uh, drawings. It's really not apparent to me. So um, for me, story poles would be like the very minimum that I would want to be able to actually go out there and visualize it in relation to the vegetation, to my property, which is at a slightly higher elevation. Um, you know, section drawings uh, are not going to tell the whole story. There's one section drawing on the latest geotechnical report, and it, there's no detail from the edge of the tank to my property. It shows a distance from the redwood grove to the tank, and and then that's it. So I just so I don't have any confidence at the moment in knowing actually what we're dealing with um, visually. Um, so the other thing is I, I'm going to back up a little bit. Um, I was kind of surprised that the that alternative three is being dismissed right away. Um, I'm a retired general contractor. I've done a lot of engineered projects, um, engineered grade beamings, uh, beams, uh, piers, retaining walls. Um, I'm really familiar with geotechnical reports. I looked at both of those. Um, it seems to me that both sites are really stable and the site that you, the existing site that you have, there's already the neighborhood's already used to that. They're used to the impact, whatever that is. Um, and it also looks like you're going to add a 62,000 gallon tank there, and you're going to keep those two existing tanks in place until the new tank is active. So if you're looking for additional um, storage area. Why couldn't you increase, for instance, the height? That tank is only 16 feet tall. It looked to me like with the seismic stability that you have and the, and the, uh, the soil stability, that you would be able to add something to the top of that. Maybe not increase the diameter, but it's right now it's drawn in at 16 feet. You could do 18 feet. Um, so I'm not sure. I'm not an engineer, so you have to run the numbers on that. But you also have the two existing sites that are stable. The tanks aren't. But why not, in addition to that, replace those two existing tanks with new 10,000 gallon tanks and have, you know, 80 to 100,000 gallons on the existing site where the environmental uh, review is already complete. Um, there's much less impact on the neighborhood other than hauling dirt down, downhill. And it's using existing infrastructure and making it denser rather than just expanding the footprint of the, of the operations up here. Now, I really appreciate that, you know, we need more storage and we need more fire flow. Um, but I'm not sure you can't achieve that on that site. And there was only one bid and that was from Granite Construction. And Granite Construction never competes on the basis of price. We you found know? that out. What's that? We found that out. Yeah. I mean, by the time you get the bids in, there's no way to save any money. How you save money is by soliciting bids from price competitive construction companies. And there are always, they're always here, even in a boom time. There are always people who want to do a better price and get the work. And the fact that you, you know, you only had one bid 
and that it was three times uh, the engineer's estimate, and it mentioned that that was exorbitant in the, uh, in the report, but as long as that's the only bid, then the comparisons between this proposed site um, up at Dundee and Country Club with the existing site are grossly exaggerated. You don't have a reasonable, if you, once you have a reasonable bid on the existing site, you'll have some means of comparison. Right now, you have a bid there that's three times what the engineer who drew the plan thought it should be. Engineers do the numbers. They work with a lot of companies, they see the follow through, so I respect that as probably close to a reasonable figure. So I think it's time to back up a little bit, do some due diligence, and see if that existing property and infrastructure can't be expanded appropriately and at a reasonable cost. I don't see that alternative being looked at. And as a general contractor and having done a number of projects like that, um, to me, you just don't have the numbers to be able to dismiss that property as a viable operation. I know those tanks are worthless and you need to get rid of those, but if you're looking for additional capacity, they could be replaced with independent pier footings. Thank you, Peter. I appreciate it. I was wanting to get everybody an opportunity to speak on this as well. Yeah, is there somebody else? Is there, yeah. Yeah, I just have a question about time in, time out. Um, what do you mean by time in and time out based on your experience working in neighborhoods like our neighborhood? Is this going to be like, we have many families with kids that need to school that should I just stay away from not coming even home, or is it going to be like hours, like when I better stay home for a few hours and I cannot even get out of the house, or let's say coming back from work, should I just go somewhere before the road will be open for public again? Like, what do you mean by time in, time out? A lot of times they'll do like a 45 minutes to a half hour, or to an hour and a half closures. It's more like road work, like. Yeah, and it'll just be closed for 45 minutes to an hour and a half and then they'll open it up for a half hour or whatever and let people in and out. And then they'll close it back down and do the same thing and throughout the day. That's how they usually do it to let people in and out. It's just never closed overnight or you know, yeah. for hours. It's closed at, you know, like James says, 45 minute increments and there's plating there for emergencies if there is an emergency out. And a lot of times people say, hey, I have an appointment, I'm leaving for the airport at such and such a time. And then our staff make sure the road is open at that time. We work with neighborhoods. And we work around school times, too. Yeah. I mean, obviously, we know and people garbage, have kids. And mail. Yeah. Uh, and the newspapers. There's several facets that go Garbage the days. Day. We yeah. won't even be able to close the road on garbage yeah. days. We bring, or we bring the cans down. I mean, we, we have a lot of experience working on one-lane roads. I mean, at some point, those, that pipe's going to be replaced anyway. Definitely. Whether it's, on, whether it's, 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 whether it's in conjunction with the tank project correct. or not. So these impacts will have to That's be faced correct. at some point That's in the future. That's correct. Uh, Nick? Yeah, I just wanted to ask a couple more questions that have come up from other people's comments, if it's OK. Uh, um, what if there's an emergency up there? I mean, this really impacts the road a lot more than the other side, although you, I, I see your point. All the trucks that will be coming up for the other side for excavation. However, there's more traffic than ever. and you know. A lot of times people need to get someplace at a certain time, and especially if there's an emergency. We have a lot of older folks up there, we have a lot of kids up there too. So what happens then? I mean, really, this shuts down our neighborhood. You say in 45 minutes to half an hour, usually. What happens when it's two hours? Or what, Emergencies aren't planned. I mean, there's a lot of traffic up there that's going to be severely impacted. And the other thing I wanted to mention is I like Bruce's idea that you know, 88,000 for 88,000, you know, I think that that sounds reasonable. It takes our neighborhood into consideration more. And we don't have any real idea of what it's going to look like now. And 
you're still getting a lot more storage than you would on the other side. There's so many benefits. And if you can keep the, the, the pump station a little further away from the road, I don't think that's impossible. That's just consideration. So I do see it as, as possibly workable, but the size of the tank is a really big issue for everybody in our neighborhood. It's just too big for the neighborhood. And everybody here wants the storage, but not that much. So when you say you think everybody wants a 120,000 gallon tank, you might be wrong. Not everybody does. So I'm just asking you to consider the damage to our neighborhood during the construction, and it's doubtful it'll take three to four months. Come on, stuff always runs over time. So, you know, not always, but a lot of the time it does. So, you know, there's going to be some really negative impacts in the neighborhood, and I'm just asking you to minimize them. And the one I'm concerned about the most, since it's going to, since it's going to be at such a large tank, is the size of the tank and the placement of the tank. Uh, Th those are my major concerns. Also, the two-inch pipe, I don't think it would need to be replaced under the road. I mean, you could just leave it there, couldn't you? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm saying that when you go to put in new pipe for to upgrade the neighborhood, because two-inch doesn't provide fire flow. And at some point right. in this, oh, okay. in some point in our entire district, all of our two-inch lines, of which we have about 50% of our pipe is, is four-inch or below, they're all going to have to be replaced with six-inch. And so you're going to have to, at some point, maybe it's not next year, year after, or five years from now, <coughs> whatever, but the neighborhoods are going to be impacted as those right. pipes get right. replaced. Understood. And there's, there's the, the alternative is you keep using the two-inch pipe, so you'll never have fire flow. Mm -hmm. And at some point, those pipes are going to break down and start leaking, and that's not good either. But there wouldn't be a pipe up the road to that site, my, my property, because if, if you went with your present site, then that wouldn't be necessary. You could just close well, it off. Yeah, there's mainland in there. There's houses along there we serve. Them. There is piping in the ground there now. But some of it comes from the top down, some of it comes from the bottom it's up. Probably 70 years old. Yeah, I sure. mean, I, it's, it's all two inch or less. Your name, everybody's neighborhood <laughs> at some point is going to be upgraded, and you're going, well, I live in a one lane road too. And it's, you know, when our road gets upgraded, it's not going to be fun. There's no question. But the alternative is to keep using what we've got and not upgrade it. That, that, that's not good for the safety of the neighborhood, and that's not good for the amount of water that is leaking out of some of these old pipes. And we're taking water out of the environment that we don't need to be doing. And then Chuck had mentioned uh, the road, and I think somebody else might have too. Uh, Rick, you parked on the road, and you saw how narrow it is right on Dundee, right by where the site is. And so trucks would be coming in and going out probably through that area too. And that road is so narrow that if anything was parked on the side of the road, it's not going to fit the way it is now. So it would need to be dug out a little bit more there. And also that road, I have patched it probably 20 times in the past 20 years. And it's all little patches. It's very thin. So I really expect that Dundee will be damaged along there and that the parking is going to be severely impacted during this construction. Uh, what can you, well you did say that if you, if you damage the road you'll fix it in the areas other than that. So that would uh, also apply to Dundee? If we, if we excavate or install piping or in the course of the, the tank construction and we damage the road, we will go in and repair it. Okay. I mean, that we're not going to go in and overlay or, or do something on a portion of the road that we don't damage right. Right. or we did not. Uh, I'm talking about park. the area where you parked, right there. You know I, I'm not sure how we're gonna how we would go into the parking. Okay. We're not that far along yet. Well, um, the problem with going in from the front is that you've got that grove of redwood trees, yeah. and they're all kind of together. So uh, you, I, I would be able to go in through the it, side it, of our road. It, it looks like you know from this glance that we would go in, but you know, Darren hasn't sat down, uh, our engineer hasn't sat down, and uh, James hasn't. We haven't sat and, and, and discussed and and really looked at laying out the site. Right. But well, yeah, you, you could see that the redwoods are close enough that you can't bring any kind of major size stuff through there, or even medium. So you're going to have to come in through Dundee because the other side's a steep hill. So that basically really impacts our road, and I'm sure there'll be some damage, but the parking there, there, there it's barely <coughs> possible to park a medium sized car there now. And, well, I, I, and to have I big agree. Trucks. Okay. I so, agree that there's parking issues up there, there's parking issues all over. Right, right. that's true, yeah, that's especially on the mountainside. So, I, I totally so if you were that. going to have trucks going in from Dundee, you would make sure that Dundee remains clear by them being far enough off the road that, say, a UPS truck could get past? Reasonably, yes. Okay.
you know, I, I can't tell you every scenario and that, but we would try, we would work very diligently to keep the roads open, not just park equipment in the street to block your access. Right. But there may be times that, you know, deliveries, pulling up and that, that there may be, you know, construction, there's going to be, um, there will be some inconveniences, you know, no doubt. Well, I, I think everybody knows that construction um, causes inconveniences, but but the fact is, is that we need access. There's a lot of people living. Uh, there. I, I can definitely tell you between the two projects, the, the to go back to our original site has a much bigger impact uh, and environmental and and visual. When we cut that mountain off, remove six seven hundred yards of material, cut all of the redwood trees down. There's going to be huge impacts down there. Well, those are smaller redwood trees than those things grow. Yeah. Um, and then kind of real quick to go back to the other gentleman's question about reusing that site. The existing tanks are not even on our property. One of the tanks are not on our property. They're the town rival. Really? Unfortunately, we're not even, and we can't have tanks at different levels because they won't flow and operate. We maxed out, we engineered that parcel, and we maxed out the biggest tank we could put there on pad. You have sizing requirements, earthquake sizing with tanks on heights and diameters. You do not want narrow, tall tanks. They have a tendency to fall over. You want the match of the width and the diameters and the height. Um, and tanks come in preset sizes. When you start going in designer sizes, you pay through the nose because they're specially made. So tanks come in, in preset sizes. And in California, it has a pretty stringent seismic requirements. Um, and you want to more, more square than tall and narrow. And the county won't let us continue to build the right of way, I don't suppose. <laughs> well, we even are trying to cut into that embankment and get county right of way permission to put a place. We, we have a hard time pulling off the road down there now. Mm -hmm. We take up half the road because of the, of the location. Mm -hmm. And we have more than one truck there. We pretty much block the road and we're constantly moving vehicles. And, we're moving vehicles. and there's a mailbox there and, and a fire hydrant and, and so forth. You know, of the two sites, uh, the Nikari site is is the desired site for the district. Rick, um, excuse me, Mr. President. I, I think we're going over the same topics okay. again and again. We need to cut this. We're on okay. item number two in old business. We have four more items in old business and then new business. Not a problem. Can we please, if, unless there's something new to discuss, okay. I think we need to move on. I did have one thing real quick, and I promise not to take sure. it Sure. <coughs> Everybody's talking about this time closure and stuff, but, you know, I really hope you guys know how to work with God for medical emergencies, because there's a lot of people off Dundee that have medical issues, and that whole mountain. There's a lot of older people up there. And I don't plan on having a heart uh, incident and not having an ambulance being able to get to me. So what would be... The thing, I shouldn't be home during the construction time. I'm retired. I worked my whole life to be retired and enjoy the property up there. Um, that needs to be considered too. It is. Is there a state regulation or fire regulation around minimum size of tank for battling a structure fire? There is. And what are those? I don't really want to my head. I, I do believe it's it's X amount of gallons per minute for so many minutes that it figures out to right around 120,000 gallons. Okay, so the 120 is in the That's, in that's the number that comes from the county fire rate. For, so if we for, for a single, single family structure fire, that's correct. Right. Um, Darren, if you want to if, if comment on that, that. I don't have any better information. Okay. And so, doing anything smaller, would we have to get a variance or no? We permission? Can, we can go smaller. It's just we we don't meet fire flows, and then it gets into when one of the neighbors are go to build, add on, mm -hmm. and the fire district or the fire sprinkler people contact us and want to get fire flow calcs. We don't have it, and what they do, they start requiring to put in those ten thousand gallon poly tanks. Personal, yeah, personal fire protection. Tell you people up in that area don't have a lot of room for those. You know, they're cumbersome, no one likes to do them, they're expensive, and that's what we should do. San Jose Valley Water District should provide fire flow. And anytime we go into a neighborhood and do an upgrade, we should try to, to meet state standards. We can't always do it, and we couldn't do it at the existing site. And that's why we had to come down to 64,000. But we only have 15,000 there, 20,000 there now. 
-hmm. Something yes. like that. So anything is better. The 64 was much better than what we had. It didn't meet the, the county fire requirements. And, you know, some fire sprinklers are going in on a lot of almost all new homes. We are doing more and more work with the with fire companies and the fire districts on fire flow. And they're requiring more and more of those poly tanks. Mm -hmm. um, we look at it as our responsibility to provide those flows. Um, and we try to every time we go into a neighborhood. We went into the upper scenic drive neighborhood <coughs> like 20 years ago and we replaced all the inch and a half and above ground mains and put in six inch. Mm -hmm. We put a lot of the larger size backbone through those one lane roads and all the way up and down. Uh, it's a project, there's no doubt about that. The, the, the concrete trucks had to have to straddle the trench line in order to, to bring slurry back in. They're, 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 construction is, is difficult, but it's doable. Um, on that. But we always try when we go into a neighborhood, and we're not always successful, to upgrade to the, the state standards and today's standards. Thank you. Any other uh, directors have questions? I don't have a question, I'd just like to uh, comment. Yeah, make a comment. Um, when I first heard about this project, I was very enthused for a, a number of reasons. And I'm really glad that we're at the point now where we have some public input. But the reasons I was impressed or uh, enthused when I first heard about this project is uh, hearing from staff that this project, if we chose this Macari site, would save the district over $300,000, or about $300,000. That's something that we're all concerned with in this water district. I thought that was a great positive. The environmental damage that is going to have to be done to the present site with removal of redwood trees versus minimal disruption on the Macari site was an environmental plus for doing this. And the fire flow and the water distribution to the neighborhood up there was another. So three pluses were going on here. And we've been, uh, the district manager and the council have been doing some negotiation and I'm glad it's to this point where now we've kind of settled on a price and we can get onto the, the nuts and bolts of this, all right? I do agree that we need a rendering so we can see what we're doing up there. All right, everybody, our imaginations are one thing. We need to see some physical props, all right? As far as uh, Nick guarantees, um, I don't know if, what guarantees you can, or you, you might be happy with, but um, past behavior is a guarantee, is you know an indicator of what's going on. And um, most of the activities that I've seen in the Water District do, um, particularly most recently, have been in really good faith. And um, the most recent example would be, now that I'm being a board member here, is I've seen the probation tank. What the water district staff and the contractors have done to environmental mitigation and neighborhood impacts has been um, exemplary. All right? I couldn't imagine how they could do any better job. That's not a neighborhood, though. Um, and I agree, but they're good. now the next things that we've reviewed over in, during my time here is we reviewed uh, the Lompico uh, tanks. All right, so there's uh, six tanks that are going in there, you know, kind of like your neighborhood. It's restricted roads, small roads. Um, they're considerate. All right, so I have um, a positive feeling that everyone will be considerate to the maximum that they can possibly be. These people, we all live here and work here together with you and your neighbors. We're not trying to pick you out or anything else like that. We all go through the same problems, all right? So I, I don't think there's a problem with consideration. Um, Well, I, I think I think that's it. And the other thing, and Rick didn't mention it as well, is I know we're worried about the impacts to you know being able to get in and out of there. They're <laughs> temporary; they're not permanent. And um, people work with you, and they'll try to do the best they can. And uh, that's all we can expect of anybody to improve the area that we live in, have better fire protection, and uh, uh, the. The real matter here is that those tanks that are there need to be replaced. 
So we're going to have to find something, right? So I think we're doing a, a real good job of doing that. And if we can work out these other details, uh, this can be another project that uh, the Water District can say went uh, well. That's my thanks. Any other uh, comments from the directors? Yeah. So um, I live across from a tank <laughs> on one lane road. So I, you know, I understand the, um, the situation probably um, as well as anybody. And that tank happens to be, uh, gee, I think it's a redwood tank, probably about 40 years old, something like that. So I'm, I'm facing the same kind of situation assuming the tank gets replaced at some point in the next few years. Um, so I, I take this very seriously. Um, my comments, while I agree with all the benefits of this, my comments have to do with the price. Um, I am uh, not in favor of the 88000 um, I'm in favor of a smaller number because I believe that's what the property is worth. Uh, and while I am not a fan of eminent domain, I'd rather um, uh, give that money to, no offense, Gene, I'd rather give it to Nick than to the attorneys. Um, I believe the 88000 is excessive for the parcel that we're looking at um, purchasing. Um, and I think that there's a precedent that we're about to take that is also, for me, over the long term, um, something I'm very uncomfortable with. Um, I've also heard what the neighbor has to say. I think it's reasonable for us to try to come up with some way of being able to show what this is going to look like um, prior to actually doing something. Um, in my opinion, I think the um, I think the concerns there should be able to be addressed very fairly quickly with story polls or something that would be able to. Uh, show where this tank's going to uh, go and, and what it's going to look like. Um, I do think, though, that if this parcel is acquired, it needs to be acquired uh, without a lot of constraints on it, um, for sure. Um, I agree with Lois on that, that it, it needs to be something that the district can work with. Um, I think the district has shown really great uh, diligence with the probation tank. I have no doubt the staff will do the same kind of diligence for this parcel, assuming that it, it is something that can be acquired. Um, relative to buildable, I think we might use the term buildable in an uh, imprecise fashion. Um, I look at more as a market price. What is the price that someone would pay for a 6,000 square foot parcel in a I think it's an R115 zone that is simply not big enough to put a residential structure on it. A market price is not a price that one individual would pay, it is a price that the market, that is a willing buyer, willing seller would pay. I own three of those kind of parcels and I believe my market price in those three is about $2,000 a piece. So I, I think even $10,000 is, is an incredibly generous um, appraisal for that um, and d d just because of the fact that those parcels are just simply um, you know lots that you can't really sell this is really your best opportunity this is your best opportunity to get some money for that outside of um, us you're not going to get this kind of money from anybody else as a market as a market value uh, the only other person who might be interested might be the gentleman next door. That's, that's the market. Um, and that is a market of one, not a market that's, that's broad-based. $2,000. That, that yeah, there you go. That justifies, that justifies the, the market value that you're asking for. So um, I, I think this is something that um, if I, I would like to see this negotiated differently. Like I say, I'm not a fan of the eminent domain. Um, I hope that we can reach a price, but if it's 88000 I, I have a real problem with that. Can I respond? Can I respond? I'm sorry. Can I respond to what you just said? Can you do it in 30 seconds or less? I will. Uh, the fact is, is that 
That's an unbuildable parcel except for the district, and there's an appraiser that can prove it, that will go with that, and he will do that, and it can come up a lot higher than 88,000. That's not my main point, though. <laughs> <laughs> We've that. heard that argument before, though. Okay. So thank you. Um, 30 seconds. We can, yeah. Lou, you want to make a motion? Or is there any other comments from the directors? Okay. I'll make a motion. I'll make a motion that the recommendation be followed, that we uh, direct our current negotiators, district manager and legal counsel, to uh, to continue to negotiate with uh, Mr. Nakari and see if we can come to an agreement on both the terms and price for the property. And how long are we going to continue? Uh, we want to put a time I think, we would, I think we would request, if possible, if the board is going to direct that course of action, to either approve the draft written offer that's in front of you or approve something very close to it with modifications. This is the offer that, that you wrote, right? That's right. That would be the offer of purchase price of 88000 Right. But without. Question. Yeah. Um, assuming the board approves that offer letter, uh, will there be a subsequent vote on uh, approval of a contract or anything like that? Should Mr. Nakari decide to accept it? Yes, there would be a subsequent vote on the contract. Of course, the contract. Um, there is a degree of commitment involved in the offer, so. The assumption would be that, you know, absent some unforeseen circumstance, that an agreement consistent with the term sheet would be approved, assuming environmental review. Yeah, but there is a, there, there has to be another. Step, yes. But I have. What about the things besides the ADA bills? <coughs> that would be included also. That's right. The, I, the council's letter, the exhibit you have, is acceptable. With staff, the uh, you know the, the trees, the arborists, and so forth. Let's take all that into consideration. We we reviewed that, and that's our counter. We can. Uh, uh, oh, it's your it's, counter. It's, it's our counter back to his last. Oh, okay. Except for the size of the tent. Except the size, and, and that's not in there. I mean, we did not. We did not limit the size of the tent in our counter. And the exhibit A that council handed out tonight. <coughs> we believe is, is a good offer. Okay. But didn't we hear multiple people from the neighborhood object to the size of the tank? Yes. Just, yeah. just to be clear, um, there's no commitment being made at this point to the size of the tank right. one way or the other. It's simply avoiding tying the district's hands in terms of what the tank size might be able to do. So they really haven't determined this, the size to be of the tank tonight. Or, or have not. At the, at so the same point, size is to be determined. It's to be determined once we, pay or, you know, we get on the property okay. and, and so forth. And when, excuse me, and when we determine the tank size, can we have uh, the best rendering? Can we have some sort of renderings that give a more graphic example? We can. Yeah. Okay. But I, also, I still have the question are we just going to go on? And on this, are we going to put a time limit? There is a time limit in uh, council's okay. letter. Okay. In front of I didn't well, have time to read all her. Letter. March twelfth. We just March got twelfth. Okay. Yeah, this would be just to be clear. This would the, the draft offer letter that you received that we're recommending approval of uh, has the eighty-eight thousand price. Right. It has the same terms as the last offer that the district gave, with some additional agreement as to the vegetation to be replanted at the completion of construction. Um, it, uh, it doesn't have anything else new in terms of the non-monetary terms. It's 88,000, last, best, and final. Um, very consistent with what the district previously offered. So that's the motion. Okay. And I'll second the motion. Thank you. Holly, would you like to record the vote? Thanks. Hold on just a moment. Director Ferris? Aye. 
Director Falls? No. Director Moran? Yes. President Swan? Yes. Director Henry? Yes. Motion passes. Thank you. We're moving right along. We're up to 10C. Thank you all for coming. Uh, you might want to stay. Give me a second. I'm going to go along. This will be the declaration of. Yes, Declaration of Surplus Property uh, APN 22601 05, uh, commonly known to the district as the Magnano Woods Well and Treatment Plant, located in the Scott Valley on King Village Drive next to the Scott Valley Post Office. Uh, it's recommended that the Board of Directors review this memo and approve the following Adopt the attached resolution declaring district parcel APN 022601 05 as surplus property, commonly known as Manana Woods uh, Well and Water Treatment uh, Facility, uh, contract or contract uh, for a commercial property appraisal, and direct staff to move forward with procedures for surplusing property in accordance with California law. In uh, 2006, the district consolidated uh, with Manana Woods Water Company in Scotts Valley. The consolidation resulted with the ownership of Manana Woods uh, facility, including a water well and water treatment plant. The water well and treatment plant is located on APN 0226105. It's a 50 by 220 foot flat parcel adjacent to the Scotts Valley Post Office off of Kings Village Road in Scotts Valley. Uh, there's a metal building, um, fencing, uh, and a uh, solar system, and a water well located on the parcel. Due to the age of the well, 40 plus years, the location in relation to other district facilities, the age and condition of the supply line, and expensive treatment, evaluation, and permitting of the water treatment process, the district has not used uh, the water source since July 2015. In addition, this parcel is located in the area of the Scott Valley Town Plan, and the district has been contracted several times over the years inquiring to purchase this property as it's located in the proposed entrance to the commercial development. In 2018, the district uh, consolidated Manano Woods water supply permit uh, uh, from the, uh, uh, from the uh, Jurisdiction. jurisdiction. Uh, the jurisdiction of the County of Santa Cruz uh, to the main water supply permit issued by the State of California, State Water Resources uh, Control Board Division of Drinking Water. With this permitting, the district did not um, include the water source and treatment plant as a water source. The permitting process with the State of California would have required extensive scientific review, pilot testing of the treatment process, and upgrade to the treatment plant. Uh, the state permitting requirements are much more stringent than the county's permitting process. Surplusing land is complicated, and the subject uh, to Surplus uh, Land Act, as recently modified by new law passed in 2019, uh, AB 1486, legal counsel will be involved in ensuring that any other or sale of surplus land by the district is made in compliance with California law. Um, in full compliance on uh, on this, the city of Scotts or Scotts Valley Water has contacted the district and is very interested in this parcel um, that's driving the surplus of this property at this time. Um, they have an interest in uh, possibly doing some treatment um, uh, at that location. Same kind of treatment? No, that treatment is not really accepted by the state of California. Um, and I did have some information to go into the type of treatment that's there. It's a, it's a microbiological biological treatment process that doesn't really have any form of structure to it and the state will not accept it without extensive testing and to know just what the process is. It's not a can process at all, it's a bacteria that, that eats the carbon, I guess. Um, when uh, the, uh, from the, from the contaminated wells so I'm asking the board uh, to surplus. Uh, we will get a uh, appraisal, and we'll work with legal counsel on the proper 
for disposal. I can give you an appraisal of $88,000. <laughs> I feel this property is probably has pretty good value because of its location. It's commercial. It is commercial and about a quarter acre. Yeah, and it is right in the town plan. We have been contacted by several developers, but they say the town plan is dead now. I find that hard to believe that it's eventually there won't be something there. <coughs> the process for doing surplus property, um, once we get it appraised, I assume we have to get it appraised, if, or do we? I think we should. Okay. Yes. Then yeah. do we have to offer it to other public agencies first? Yeah. Is that the yes. way it goes? Yes. Yeah. yeah, that's how it works. Yeah. And which agencies depends on exactly what criteria it meets. Yeah. And then after that, it would go to a, if everybody turned it down, then it would go to a bid. Right. Or some of, some kind of an auction process or, or auction. a bid process yeah. or something. Scotts Valley Water District being a public agency. Public agency, yeah. most likely. Um, City of Santa Cruz might be interested. City of Santa Cruz might be interested since they own Sky Park. They own the old airport. Um, I don't know. We haven't crossed that bridge yet. Thanks. It, it, it has no use to the district. It has an extremely long old pipeline that goes from the well site all the way up Mount Hermit Road and down mm -hmm. uh, Whispering, Pines. Whispering Pines, through the townhouses, through parks. Oh my oh, goodness. It's old. It goes right through Hocus Pocus Park. It, it leaks. Uh, yeah. It has nothing but problems. You know, it's old. Yeah. It's probably over 70 years old. It's, the it's unusable at this point. Yeah, it's the, it's the original Manana Woods, one of the original Manana Woods sources. It, has the well been destroyed? One of them has, and one of them hasn't. And it's, it's not a it's a forty plus year old well. Uh, yeah, it's just disconnected from the system. Yeah, it's time. been totally disconnected and not permitted. It's a it's not a permitted source. Mm -hmm. Any other comments? Questions? Public? So, Hello there. Are they thinking about using this to treat the contaminated water at the old Watkins Johnson site? Is is that what they're I didn't quite understand that. Scotts Valley really hasn't told me their reason. Uh, why they want it, except that they're looking at it as a treatment facility. So it's the Scotts Valley Water, and I don't think they have anything to do with Watkins Johnson. Um, I'm not sure what their their thoughts are. But isn't that part of the Scotts Valley? Well, the the contamination at the Manana Woods well didn't come from um, Watkins Johnson. That contamination came from what they call the four or the Camp Beavers, the four corners. Uh, gas stations and that's been cleaned and cleared and there's not the text in that water so that's been cleaned up so the, the existing well there when it was shut down did not have any any further contamination and the Watkins Johnson plume does not come that way that's the kind of treatment they're doing I, I they didn't really divulge to me exactly what they wanted to do um, I didn't really ask you would they be allowed to use the water from the existing well? I would say yes. If they wanted, if yeah, they, they'd, they'd have to get so it approved. Part of the purchase. They would have to put a, a new right. treatment plan in, get it state yeah. approved, and apply for a all water supply. That are unaffordable. <laughs> uh, all, all things that right. can be done. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Except that they start drawing water, they could pull that plume in that direction. They could. We never did. I mean, it was never an issue <coughs> with us. It's a very small production well now. They increased the production well, then all bets are off. It's a very small producer. That was the other like problem. 40 gallons a minute. 40 gallons a minute. It was very small mm -hmm. for the amount of treatment process and the cost um, through that. The treatment plant is was built by the oil companies as part of remediation. It was done very substandard. It started falling apart. There's patches all through it. it it's been been mandated back together from the leaks in there. Um, it has a lot of issues. Yeah. I think it's safe to say they do not want it for 40 gallons a minute. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure what. And, I, well, you know, the treatment system that's in there, yeah. there's very little of it that's. Yeah, they can replace the treatment. They, yeah, they can yeah. replace the treatment, they could drill a new well. There's already a second well in the parcel that's been abandoned. Two others. Yeah, two others. So, I, you know, I, to me, it, for my district, it, it wouldn't be, and it's a bad location. For me, 
I don't see them spending a lot of money on it, but they, they sure are interested in it. Thanks. Bruce. Thanks. Um, so what you described about the, uh, the water permit switching from county to state back in 2015, I guess that means that back in 2015 you really decided that you don't need this well anymore. Otherwise you would have tried to keep it under that permit, right? <coughs> we, weren't, we weren't able to treat the water that was coming out of the well. They turned up really high in magnes. Magnes? Magnum. 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 Yeah. Uh, that. I remember that three times. So. That, yeah. treatment, yeah. that treatment system there was no longer mm -hmm. able to treat that water. Okay. So, I mean, the way you presented it is sort of like, oh, by the way, we dropped this off, so, you know, we can't use it anymore anyway. But really, the decision was made five years ago that you were done with the well. That's true. We're, you know, from the, from the knocks on the door, from the town plan, and all wanting to buy the parcel for the entrance, including relocating the post office. And that we saw a, kind of a handwriting on the wall that we were going to be right in the middle of Scott Valley's town plan, and we really didn't want to be there. We didn't want that long pipeline that's starting to leak in Mount Hermon Road and in the back of the townhouses. Um, we shifted our production. We did the intertie connections that the oil company well, I, paid. Well, okay, okay, but I don't quite yeah. understand why. I mean, I don't really see why you necessarily need to worry about the Scott Valley town plan. I mean, that, that's well, because they were knocking on our door for the parcel. They wanted well, the parcel. I remember, no, I remember. Um, and I remember some developer coming here to some finance committee meeting or yeah. something, and he, and he said, oh, we'll, we'll make you whole. You know, let us, you mm -hmm. know, let us. And I was thinking, make us whole. That's it. I mean, <laughs> we, we got plenty of things to do without the headache. Why? Uh, so, um, anyway, it didn't, anyway. Um, <laughs> now, the... Santa Cruz, you know, where the airport used to be, Santa Cruz uh, owns a big piece of that, and uh, I guess it's their redevelopment or the successor of their redevelopment agency or something that owns that land. And um, I mean, the fact that Scotts Valley doesn't own it, the city, of, the fact that the city of Scotts Valley does not own it itself, um, I think, complicates their negotiations with developers. That no matter what they want to do with their town plan, they've always got to pay Santa Cruz by the end of the deal. And um, huh. um, so in a way it seems like maybe the city of Scotts Valley might be a potential buyer because it's been a sticking point in their town plan. Um, and because they haven't got the land for the rest of the town plan, maybe at least they could have this little corner of it so that it doesn't cause them trouble in the future. Maybe the city of Scotts Valley would want to put it I think they just approved a tax increase this week. They must have millions of dollars. <laughs> um, let me see. So I, I'm a little more, I'm interested in this process by which you offer surplus property to other agencies. Mm -hmm. it, it doesn't mean that, it doesn't mean that you have to just give it to them at cost or just at the appraised value, does it? I mean, we could have a bidding war between the Water District and the City of Scotts Valley or something like that. But somehow, the public agencies get put in in in, in first in line. In first they, I mean, I mean, there could be a developer. I, so I mean, we could have multiple part. This is more interesting piece of property than the other one, by the way. So <laughs> you, yeah, you could have multiple people interested in it, multiple organizations interested in it. Some private and some public. But do the public ones get uh, an advantage? And I've got one more thing to say if I can get the answer to this one. Uh, do you, uh, is there a preference? Is there a pecking order? Is there, like there's a pecking order in that you have to offer it first mm -hmm. to certain designated agencies. You don't have to accept their offers. Yeah. For the most well, part, I think that I wouldn't want to say that 100%, but I think that's basically right. You just have to offer it to them first. So they're not really under any. They don't have any advantage over any other potential buyer. Well, why would you have to offer it to them? Just so that they know. Just to, sure to see if they want to pay a lot of money for it. <laughs> it's in. I think it's over here. It's more the other way around. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Um, I'm, I guess I'm a little more confused. But um, you, you can talk too, you know. <laughs> and you did. And you can have another chance as far as I'm concerned. Um, Okay, so the other thing I want to bring up 
is that you remember the, uh, the triangle under the creek down in Felton, the little piece of property that was the triangle under the creek at the bottom of the creek. Bruce, we're you. getting off the top. <laughs> no, I'm not. No. <laughs> Stay on this Yes, one. sir. Um, there was a piece of property in Felton that the district, district surplused. And in that neighborhood, um, there was someone that owned almost an acre. And uh, when they bought the little triangle, it made it an acre, and it made their other <laughs> piece of property buildable. Um, meanwhile, there were other people in the neighborhood who were happy the way the neighborhood was. And they didn't want a house put on that piece of property. And they would have been happy to buy the triangle and keep it forever, just so that nobody could ever put it together with the uh, 0.95 acre parcel that existed. So, um, it turned out that according to the district policy manual, when that piece of property was surplused, I don't think I got my full five minutes, but because I think there was other conversation going on. Um, Bruce? I'm trying. Hurry up. The, board, the district policy manual said that there would be sealed bids. And there were sealed bids. One was for $10,001, one was for $10,010. I think that piece of property should have been put up for auction. I think it should not be a sealed bid when you have a piece of surplus property. I think it should be auctioned off to the highest bidder. And that way the district will realize the highest value for the land. So I believe that the policy manual that's in effect right now, if you don't do anything, says that Rick will go off and ask for sealed bids in the long run. And I don't think that's a good way to sell a piece of property. I think sealed bids is a good way to uh, get contracts, to, to, to uh, get bids on contracts. But you don't want to do that with an auction process because you don't want to drive people down to an, an amount where they can't make a profit. So there's a reason to have sealed bids for construction contracts, and there's a reason not to have a sealed bid for this kind of a property sale. I believe it should be an auction process. And if you need to change the board policy manual before you do it, I think you should think about it. Thank you, Bruce. Good input. Is it in the manual? Oh, it's in the board policy manual. We'll have to look. I thought, yeah, we're going to go through through district council and, and we will review that. I'm not sure that's in the word that's outstated. But we'll review that. Larry, you had a comment? Yeah, thank you. Um, I had the opportunity with Rick's help to collect all the documents on the on the known surplus proper to be potentially surplus property for the district going back to 2009. So I studied that um, situation, mostly looking at um, what the potential value to the district would be for, for various lands, whether they be watershed or some kind of extraneous piece of property like this one. So anyway, in general, I think it's very reasonable to surplus a piece of property like this, and I and I support it. However, this this Mariana Woods property was not in any of the documents that you gave me, so I wasn't able to take a look at it before the meeting tonight. So um, it's it's okay. I just you no. Know, the reason it wasn't in the documents, it wasn't till. Have you seen no, that? I have that. Okay. I, I, mean, I know what you're talking about in the, in the parcel manual. The, those parcels did not get transferred over to the district oh. when the manual was done. And then about, the manual hasn't been updated once since those. We had a long legal um, process to get those parcels transferred from the ownership of Manana Woods yeah. into the San Lorenzo Valley <laughs> Water District. Yeah. We finally got that done, but the manual wasn't updated with those parcels that okay. came over. Okay. That wasn't yeah. that long ago. Yeah, no, it, it was a long, ago. unfortunately, it was, yeah. a, it was a very lengthy process because we let it lapse, and Mariano Woods' business license expired, so there was nobody legally that could sign the deeds to transfer over. So we had to redo it. We had to get Mariano Woods reinstated as a business. It took years. No, oh, that's fine. Then yeah. I, I just have a couple of But letters. you're right. If they're not, to answer your question, you're right. Okay. Okay, good. So I'm going to continue to keep my ears tuned for the word surplusing property. Right. Um, so a couple of quick questions. Would it, would it actually reduce district costs to get rid of this property? Yes. I mean, <coughs> significant costs? 
Well, we have we have sewer fees. We have uh, right. power. Um, okay. Even so, we're not using power. We have you know we have costs, okay. insurance, liability. Homeless um, people will be in. We've had some theft through the fence, holes cutting through the fence, and okay. so forth. You've convinced yeah. me. That's why. Let me ask another question. What um, would there is there any possible value to our water district to having this property for injecting water into the into the groundwater? I mean, would this because there's already a well there, could it be used to inject water to help build up the groundwater? I mean, there there might that be well some. wouldn't be used for that, but you could no. use that. I, I I really think that's what the the city's probably looking at it. Scotts Valley is looking at it for just further down the road, I would think. Okay. Um, Santa Cruz has talked about doing injection wells on their property, the old yeah. Sky Park Airport. So, uh, you know, a, a water well for production isn't designed the same way a, a injection well is. Okay. But you could put an injection well there. Yes. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Are, are you saying into existing wells or to drill a new well? It has to be a new well. You have to drill a new well. Yeah, they're different, completely different design. So that's a, that's high cost. Yeah. So, yeah. In versus that. Thank you. Sure. Done. Yeah. Um, well, Larry touched on what was coming to my mind was um, the ASR potential for it. And you, there's two years to get a GSP basically in place now. And I'm a person that likes to keep their options open and how you handle things. And I just wonder, I mean, I, you're, you're touching on, you know, it's, Scott's probably interested in using it for injection. And since the projects haven't been materialized yet, and that's being discussed, I don't know that Scott's Valley would necessarily do that as part of it. I mean, would the GSA ever have a project? Or how would, I, I would just leave, I, I understand. I mean, for two years, hold on to it, see what happens, and, you know, look at it at the end of that. Um, Definitely good. This is the first I've heard about, or, or first I've okay, heard about somebody really showing a lot of interest in it. So, um, yeah, I keep doing too many things in general. So, uh, <laughs> uh, they come in handy sometimes. <laughs> We're trying to clean out the garage, I think. <laughs> it's just a location. It's just a location over. Sooner or later, something's going to be built out there. Yeah. It's going to be right in the middle. And then you've got a great parking position. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> our infrastructure, I mean, doesn't even touch there to be able to yeah. do that on our own. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But you're bringing a nice, valuable thing to the GSA. I don't know. Bob, any questions? Well, yeah, I mean, I was going to say it's so far off of our uh, of our district property that it would be, I think what I'm hearing Chuck say is it would be basically a bargaining chip, negotiating position, what have you, some exchange of value for something else that we might want out of the uh, GSA process. Is that, am I... Yeah, and I don't really know what I'm, I, just, I don't have anything concrete in mind. I'm just saying, you know, okay. no, I tell you, you know, and obviously whatever projects we do as part of Santa Margarita, there'll be joint projects, I would think, will be involved. I mean, I just assume not take on any more facilities. I'd rather have somebody else take on the facilities to, to own them and to run it. Um, they overdrafted it. They can pay for it. <laughs> but um, so, I, so I, what I'm hearing is is that yeah, you you could do that, but in the end of the day, again, it's so far out of our yeah. it is. And I'm you know I'm Area. looking at another parcel, working with another developer for an injection site, a potential site or a well site, okay. like over up by the golf course. Okay. Um, a, 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 a very similar size lot okay. as part of that development. Yeah. Uh, and you know, right in our service area. Okay, great. Thanks. <coughs> but, you know, I have to, I can agree with Chuck that anything's possible, and it's obviously if they want it for a reason. Question? No, I might like to make a resolution declaring... Oh, a motion. Go ahead. Manana Wood Well Site as surplus. Craig to resolution 19-20. 19-20. I will second that motion. <clears throat> Splendid, Holly. Uh, can I speak on that motion? 
Yeah. Yes. Uh, so in the course of my becoming on this board, I've heard other directors uh, have spoken about uh, the you know, selling of surplus property to increase revenue. I support that process of selling surplus property, and however we can best get the best mm -hmm. price. And listening to Bruce's suggestion there, well, I, I, yeah. you know, it, it, I agree. I, I have no problem with doing my auction and, and that. It's just you know, it's a little more difficult for the district to facilitate, but it's out there. If we were had our, if we were more involved and maybe looked to see, we could always maybe piggyback with the county auction when they do their tax auction every X amount of years. Um, you know, to find an auction, we used to take our vehicles to auction, but try to find an auction and, you know, for our vehicles, it got more and more difficult. Um, they didn't want them and it just it, it didn't fit. But property, there are property auctions around and we could always piggyback, I think, off the county or or maybe even have our own. Yeah. So, so what, well, what, what, well, we can look. We, what, we what can definitely look. look. What I think we do need to do is make sure that the board policy manual, or excuse me, whatever policy manual, board policy manual, or whichever one it is, doesn't preclude you from doing it. Yeah, that. and I'll work with the council to make sure we on this and, and bring it back to the board. Um, so, but it doesn't change making the resolution. No, 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 no. So we can go. Hi. Director Ferris? Hi. Director Fultz? Yes. Director Moran? Yes. President Swan? Yes. Director Henry? Yes. Okay. Speeding right along. Okay, uh, the next time the, the Tim's Director of Operations will do on the generator award bid. So this is a award of bid. You missed one. We're public Advisory Committee. Public Facilities. Advisory Committee on Facilities. <laughs> I'll see. We have, we have somebody that's been waiting yeah. patient. Yeah. It's not in my... Excuse me. It's in my... The printer head there it is. The printer okay. heck up. Yeah, there we go. Uh, yes, Public Advisory uh, Committee on Facilities. It's recommended that the Board of Directors review <coughs> provide direction uh, to the Public Advisory Committee on Facilities in regards to the Board's expectations. On February 6, 2020, the Board of Directors appointed seven members to the District's Public Advisory Committee on Facilities for the sole purpose of evaluating the district's administration, operations, facility needs. On February 18, 2020, the committee held its first meeting, elected chairperson, and set the regular scheduled meeting for the fourth Thursday of the month at 3 p.m. The committee also reviewed a timeline of facility needs uh, dating back to the 1990s and discussed a comprehensive outline uh, of future topics for discussion as follows, uh, how we got to uh, where we are today, public input through a series of meetings, uh, the goals of the project, uh, needs for today and the future, uh, opportunities and constraints, key issues influence the design, uh, the size and design criteria for rooms in the building, remodel, um, uh, potential remodel of the existing admin and operations facilities or relocation, uh, board of directors, meeting room, uh, fuel storage, environmental concerns, appropriate location for the district headquarters, uh, consolidating repair materials and equipment to one location, bulk water sales, 24-hour emergency response, uh, estimated construction costs, value of the existing facilities, and a final report with recommendation, a recommendation to the full board. In the past, the board has set expectations and desires at the beginning stages of the process, such as the desired location of the admin building facilities, uh, or to be a LEED certified leadership in energy uh, and environmental design, uh, internationally rec recognized green building certification system. One of the past uh, directions from the board was the admin building needed to be accessed by public transportation. As we are in the beginning stages of this process, staff is seeking direction from the board for input on their expectations. Uh, it's anticipated this process will take uh, one year to complete. So what basically I'm asking if the, the board would have any strong desires or 
request that the, the committee look at um, moving forward on this process, uh, such as you know the bus line, where we should be located, um, those type of things. If you want to see, make sure that you get answered, or do you have something as a board? Um, give direction of something that they're strongly desire. Well, I heard that this committee is only going to meet for one hour a month. And I'm, I'm wondering if anything can get done in one hour a month. Well, a couple things. I, we have a, I think we have a really good, strong committee of right. people with various um, various skills on this subject, architectural, design, engineering, construction. Um, we think it's important that we get in information and material to the committee ahead of time to give them plenty of time to read and do research on their own after, you know, outside of the meeting. They do want to meet for an hour um, and if we find that we have issues, we can readdress that. I think we have uh, the committee chair, Beth, here, mm -hmm. okay. that may want to uh, address the board on this subject as well. Well, the other thing is we do have property, the Johnson property over there. Are, are we taking a hard look at that? or We are taking a hard look at that. My objective is to make sure that we start from the beginning, very transparent, get information out, get everything to this committee. Some of this will go fast. We have a lot of reports. We have property to look at. Uh, our next meeting will be a tour of facilities. Okay. Um, a lot of the work has already been done, but I'm not sure where the committee is going to wind up going. Okay. But the importance is, is that we get as transparent as possible, we look at everything, and we make sure that we do, you know, do a thorough job to bring back to the board. And we have, you know, we have, we have a special spot we'll have on the new website for the reports and all the information that I give, we give to the committee, that we can get posted on the website. I think it's important to get as much information out, not just to the committee, but to the public on the subject. It was a controversial subject before, as you all know. Well, yes. Yes. Yeah. Very yeah. much. You, all know. you can say that. I have six comments to offer to the committee. Number one, I agree with the accessibility by public transportation. Number two, I believe that the admin and ops should be in close proximity wherever you decide uh, to ultimately put those two. Number three, I think we should look closely at low-cost <coughs> alternatives, as Lois was saying. Renovate the Johnson Building and move admin staff in there. Four, I think we should move the boardroom to the new location giving ops room for expansion, which they desperately need. Five, I think facilities plans should be should accommodate at least 20 years of growth. I don't want to be doing this again in five or 10 years. And number six, I think that the current admin building should be surplus to partially fund expansion. It's already surplus. Right? I think it's already surplus, right? Yeah. Declared yeah, they, it, Well, it's red to believe it has been surplus, but, <coughs> we, have, but <coughs> we haven't done anything yet. We haven't done anything yet. Good list. Yeah, very good. Um, yeah, I think the list is pretty good. I uh, would probably say um, I may not be as enamored with centralization and everything everything in one location, given the nature of our district and the disasters that occur, the roads that get cut off, that sort of thing. Um, I would hope that uh, the committee would look at um, a decentralized Situation. I think there's technologies available today to allow people to meet and gather and communicate in a way that you don't have to physically be in the same room. <coughs> next next week I have a design workshop with Japan, and I'm not going to Japan. I'm doing it all through uh, uh, through um, a web conferencing. Um, the other two things um, that I have said in the past, and I don't know if the board wants to say anything about it, but no Taj Mahal, no Taj Mahal light. We're not doing a 10 or $5 million building. Those, in my mind, are just off the table to, to start. So I appreciate that we should go through that to understand the history. But if anything that gets into that, that's, that's just not happening as, as far as I'm concerned. Outside of that, 
I think we probably need to do what we did with the, the Long Pico Assessment District um, Committee. We have really skilled people, um, and I think that we need to give that committee as much latitude as possible to look at the various things that, that they might see relative to uh, how workforces work together, um, where facilities need to be, uh, what we have, what we could have, etc., and really let the committee do what we were asking them to do, uh, and and take advantage of the skills that they have so graciously volunteered to, to give to us. Because this is going to be a lot of work over the course of the year for those seven people, yeah. and I'm incredibly grateful that they've agreed to do that. So, um, outside of I think some of the opinions that we might give, I don't know that I'm really want to see the board do a formal motion that says do this. I just don't want to limit where they go. We're not asking for a motion, are we? No, I this no, and, and, you know one of the questions that came from the committee, you know, they wanted to to feel out, you know, what does the board want? Does the board have any any wants uh, a part of this process? And I have to agree with Bob. I, I would like to let, you know, the committee feel that they've got the free run to, to, to put this together. Sure. Um, you know, I plan to have the department heads do presentations. Well, what they think they need, you know, talk about, you know, James will go and talk about his operations, how he's a 24-7 operation, how he needs fuel, how he needs right. this, he needs showers, um, different types of things that he needs. Stephanie the same way. You know, the things that she needs, the type of computer terminals, uh, fireproof media cabinets or, or whatever. Darren, you know, engineering, I need room for maybe a, a plotter or do I need room for big layout tables, uh, that type of thing. Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, to answer, you know, loose questions, you know, yes, look down the road um, and what our projected growth is. I, you know, it, I think we're, our growth is not that great, you know, so we're not looking at big expansion, but it needs to be looked at. Um, you know, uh, and the department heads that you have now have been here long enough to know the areas that we need to improve, such as ADA deliveries. You know, we have to park uh, 18 wheelers in the street and traffic is all catting off us to try to get around it because we can't do unloading. or unloading the forklifts on, on inclines that are unsafe. It uh, tips off of them if you're not careful. Uh, bulk water sales trucks back up on the Highway 9 if we don't let them go fill up on a fire hydrant. You're, you've got staff here that have a lot of years of experience, and, you know, including myself, and can really help this committee. And the committee is phenomenal. Um, I think they all bet they're long-term Valley residents. Um, a, a great group of people, and I really, I really think we're going to get some good work done. Um, I'm really happy. And we'll do probably quarterly back to the board to kind of let you know and, and that and, um, and go. But I, I pretty much have given them a free, a free run. Uh, yeah, I only have uh, one guiding principle when it comes from George <coughs> Jones and Tammy Wynette, an old song. Uh, we ain't the jet set, we're the old Chevrolet set. So uh, that's my guiding principle. It's, I think we've all talked about we don't want a Taj Mahal too here or anything like that. But it's not staff's yeah. attention. <coughs> That song continues, but ain't we got love, so. <laughs> <laughs> True, too. Okay. okay. Any other? Beth, do you want to? No, I think it's been great. It's been very helpful, and I think the only, I think you guys have hit on it a little bit, but I think the other guidance that we didn't want to come with some idea that was a deal breaker. Hmm. And mm -hmm. I, so I think, you know, the Taj Mahal and the yeah. Tammy Wynette is helpful, too. And if there's anything else that's like, we do not want to even entertain that conversation. Agreed. But it's, I think it's going to be really helpful to have a lot of leeway to be creative about, uh, you know, approaching the solutions. And Rick is such a great resource. He really has such history and expertise. Outside the box. Yes. Right. And we have a wonderful group. Any other public comments? Sounds great. Go for it. <laughs> Super. Okay, terrific. So you got what you needed and yep. on to Jeff. I did.
Now I can go. Here you go. 10 E. We're up to 10 E. All right. So, so scoring at home. <laughs> so this is a award of bid purchase of new and replacement district generators. It is recommended that the board of directors review this memo and award the bid to Watson for the purchase of 10 new generators and direct the district manager to sign and enter into a contract with Watson for the procurement and startup of 10 new generators totaling $500,000. $867.87. The current 2019-2020 fiscal year budget provides for the purchase of eight district generators total budgeted at $420,000. In fe February 2020, staff mailed notice inviting bids to four generator vendors, posted newspaper ads, and posted to the district website in an effort to ex execute formal bidding procedures for the purchase of 10 generators. The number increased due to a District 45 KW mobile generator reaching the end of its life during the PG&E public safety shutoff number two in the fall of 2019, and a generator for the Madrone booster pump station was also added to this bid. Madrone booster generator was budgeted at $40,000 of fiscal year 2018-2019 and was not procured. The district received one bid after numerous calls and emails of interest about the generator bid packet. There are a total of five stationary generators that will be placed at five pump stations throughout the district and five mobile generators to run various district facilities in the event of power outages. The bid and backup from Watson is attached for review. And just to summarize what I just went over, the current Fiscal year budget provides for eight generators at $420,000 and after the loss of one district mobile generator this last fall and the addition of Madrone booster pump station generator back in, the bid came to 10 generators and the total bid came in at $500,867.87 from Watson of Corley's California. And that's the only bid we got, right? Yes. <laughs> As usual. I, I wish the gentleman was was still yeah. here to be Peter. Say, you know, yeah. just, I don't know why. What is going on here? And it was again. I mean, I got phone dollars. calls and emails from other generator vendors, and those vendors we answered their questions, put a bid on the website, and those vendors did not put in bids after. Sometimes they don't want to fill out the paper. Well, generators are selling pretty fast, right? Yeah. 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 You don't have to take the extra time to yeah. fill out, out forms. <laughs> and you can just sell. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And some of our Monterey Bay air pollution control requirements for some of the motors in California is are unique. And so that kind of slows down some of the bigger um, generator vendors. They don't want to deal with that. You know, the, the Generac CEO looks at California as a huge opportunity. Yeah, yeah, we are tier four. Everybody else tier, it, tier three. Yeah, so we have some more stringent requirements in this area too. Mm -hmm. uh, so I got a, a couple of questions. Um, so one of the things that I've learned in our uh, environmental committee meetings is talking about defensible space for fires. So these are a lot of times, these are in response to fires, right, that we're using these, or potentially pg and coming down. So is there anything we're doing for a defensible space where these things are going to be planted? The majority of the locations where they are being planted are either asphalt facilities or base rock or dirt facilities where we would be placing them. Mm -hmm. And where we do put the generators, there's a pad built, a concrete pad built, a uh, retaining wall usually put around a some kind of structure to contain that. And then the propane tank is always on a pad as well. Okay. Um, the mobile generators, obviously they're on wheels, so we park them in the dirt or on the asphalt. And then cordage is ran to the facility. But as part of our fire management plan, I think all of our facilities will right. be reviewed for defensible space in general. Yeah, that's that should be part of our yeah. fire management plan. Right. Okay. 
Uh, the other thing was, uh, so I'm seeing, you know, because I had solar panels and I lost power during the PG&E thing and everybody within, in my neighborhood, well, you have solar, you don't need to, well, we do, it doesn't, it goes into the grid or it goes off the grid. But I'm seeing that more, are, more batteries are being made available and the technology is there. Is there any point where we could, you know, consider using solar powered batteries and is, is the you know, footprint? Is much larger okay. than a generator and the at these facilities. Voltage, yeah. The amount of voltage and the startup voltage, it can yeah. much and larger, right? Very much larger footprint. Right. The footprint to start these pumps and stuff that they have to run would be massive in a battery bank. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. So uh, one more thing is uh, in my neighborhood when the power goes out, everybody turns on their generators and it's like listening to everybody mow their lawn. Right? <laughs> so uh, all at once. Um, so I, I saw they said they had uh, insulated and baffled. So there's muffler systems going on these things. They're not just white. Yeah, I mean, I have a generator, generator in my house and you can barely hear it running yeah, inside the house. Pretty quiet. Yeah. The, obviously the bigger mobile generators are a bit louder, but I mean, it's like you said, everybody has a generator running already at that time anyway. Yeah, yeah the big diesel generators do have some noise. So. Okay. Yes, yes. Gas. Yeah, sure nice. Exactly. Yeah. Any other quick? No? Uh, yeah, just real quick. So just make sure I understand how the numbers work. So this might be getting stepping in. So we budgeted 420, uh, and that's what we have available. The 40K that was budgeted the year before, is that sitting somewhere? Is that, or is that, is it? No, but it basically got washed away as we re redid the new money. So we're talking about adding $80,000 to the to the request out of this year's <coughs> budget. Okay, um, and at the last budget committee meeting, I think we got numbers that were showing we're running under budget right now by 100,000, 200,000, 200,000, something like that. Okay. Yeah, so there's plenty of space there. Mm -hmm. Different project, different capital projects yeah. that were originally planned for this year are pushed. being pushed out, yeah. So, I mean, there's plenty of, of space. In terms of the generators, did you change the mix at all from what we had originally um, voted on to meet the specific requirements that you found during the public safety, or is it basically all the same? Um, no, it was pretty much exactly what we had planned at that time yeah. before the public we, were the facilities that did need the generators. And just, just for everybody's reference, $500,000 divided by roughly 8,000 subscribers, $62.50. That's yeah, about a month's bill. Um, thank you, PG&E, um, you know, for this kind of thing. The, the cost of this public safety um, so-called power shutoff is rippling throughout everything and is a huge impact to a community that is not particularly wealthy. Um, it's a real shame, but it's something we have to do. We're not happy about it, of course, but um, I'm glad that we're able to <coughs> get these done. Now, once these are in place, are there any other generators that we're going to need to acquire? Um, at this time, no. But when we start doing these upgrades, like the new Felton Heist tank and new of Felton Heist pump station, that'll be, but it'll be added into that project yeah. at that point. Right. And so, I mean, there will be those. But pretty but much we're covered at this we're point. We're going to be covered and the f new mobile generators will be able to deploy to all these other stations that don't have them or can't have them at their site. They can only have a mobile generator coming. Okay, great. Thanks, good work. James, is there, are these mobile generators going to be diesel as well? Yes. As the fixed? Yes. Uh, have we no, the fixed generators are propane. propane. Are propane. Mm -hmm. um, have we ever had uh, complaints about, I mean, the noise I can understand, but, you know, that, that goes away when you turn it off. But the smoke, um, diesel you, smoke is very nauseous. Yeah, but now with the emissions that they have on these diesel motors, there's no, it's not the same as a diesel motor you see going down the road blowing smoke. You don't have a, you don't just have a muffler, you have a scrubber. Yeah, I mean, they have the Monterey Bay air. <coughs> requires it. Yeah, it's a whole it's a tier four form. thing that is, and it scrubs everything. Okay. Hence the forty thousand dollars. Any other director questions before we go to the public? Public? Yes. Just out of curiosity, um, are most of these generators only going to be used for a few hours to pump water up to um, 
pressure tanks, and then they are shut off for Correct. a number of hours, so they're, Correct. they're not running 24 hours. No. Any other questions, Larry? Yeah, thank you. But but they could be going for days and days, if not weeks. Yeah. And there are lots of different circumstances, including fire, which is what Rick Moran was starting to get at. One of the uh, other vulnerabilities besides the the housing or the facility itself that might be affected by fire would be this uh, this issue that the sometimes the generators need to be maintained by one of your staff people. Um, while they're running, like you might run out of gas or uh, something like that. And so I'm wondering, is there an associated uh, communication system that would enable you to monitor these generators without having to deploy a person there? Because the, the vulnerability is that the person might not be able to get there during an emergency, like right. an earthquake or a big fire. Right. But if you yeah. had a wireless, but there are so there are I, there are IoT uh, devices that would do that. Well, not only that, but I mean, we know when a generator is not producing power by the SCADA system will yeah. tell us yeah. that the pumps aren't running at that time. So we'll know something has happened if one of the generators is not running properly, or mm -hmm. isn't running at all. But for fuel, for fuel, we have people deployed in these situations anyway during these times because we have to. Do manual tank checks or we have to go to a facility, you know, we have to run from facility to facility and we have all call people and standby people for those situations. And so it would be in their daily duty to stop by in this kind of situation to make sure everything's running right. The electricians are always on board at these times. And so, I mean, it would be, it's a, it's an effort. Yeah. But so, so if uh, the catastrophe was such that the, the access was just cut off, what would your your people do? Would they hike up there? I mean, yeah. Climb over to, fallen trees. But I mean, if, if at that point, if it's a propane generator and there's no access, once it runs out of fuel, it's out of fuel. Okay. Do you have external fuel tanks for these, or just the tanks of your? The external fuel tanks are the propane tanks will be ex external from the generators, obviously, and but the for the diesel gen the trailer mounted no, it's it, it's built into the trailer. All the diesels are trailer mounted? Yes. How easy is it for somebody to swipe one of those? No, we lock them up. We take tires off of them. We do okay. chains. We have, <laughs> we have tongue locks. But I mean, there's obviously those issues, and we have to... They steal the wire. You're not going to steal one of these for but, your own but home use. when you need to use it or move it, then you got to put the tires back on and all part that. Of, part of the job. Part of the job. Okay, James. <laughs> Yeah, and James, um, are there increased operating expenses such as these? Do these need to be certified by uh, Monterey Bay Air Quality? Yes, there will be Every permitting. Year. There will be permits that will be need to be obtained, and then obviously you got an annual maintenance on every generator every year. Yeah. So and then that runs about it's they, they run from about six hundred dollars to thirteen, fourteen hundred dollars a generator. Okay. It costs a lot of money to have a water district. It costs a lot of money to make up for PG. &E. Yeah, <laughs> it does. But it will also be beneficial in just a a tree falling in the middle of the winter time in a storm or something. You know? So everybody, every, you know, we keep water in all our tanks. Yeah. Yeah, some other power sh power outage thing. You know? Right. A terrorist attack right. on the power right. power lines in Santa Clara Valley right. that happened yeah. a few years ago. Any other questions or comments from the public? Okay. Anybody want to make a motion? Yeah. Okay, I'll make a motion. So I'll uh, move that uh, we award. Uh, uh, What's on the contract for the purchase of the 10 new generators is specified and give the district manager the opportunity to sign an interview contract with What's on for the procurement and startup of the 10 new generators totaling a half million dollars in change. Second. Thank you. Holly? Director Ferris? Aye. Director Pauls? Yes. Director Moran? Yes. 
President Swan? Yes. Director Henry? Yes. Thank you all. Yeah. <laughs> Take good care of him. Oh, yeah. Moving mm -hmm. right along. Uh, Thank you, Rick. Next item one is 10 item 10F. 10F. Uh, it'll be a professional services contract and then the Fall Creek Fish Ladder. Uh, the district engineer will, will present this item. The district operates the water diversion facility on Fall Creek, a tributary of the San Lorenzo River. The diversion facility includes a fish ladder constructed in 1974. Vertical drop heights on the ladder vary from 18 to 24 inches. As part of the permitting process for a 2013 ladder improvement project, the district agreed to design and construct modifications to the ladder to meet passage criteria for all salmon, salmonid life salmonid. stages. Is that right? Salmonid. Salmonid <laughs> life stage. The project has been delayed several years while the district has tried to meet National Marine Fisheries Services NIMS guidelines for salmonid passage at stream crossings, which requires a maximum hydraulic drop between water surfaces of 6 inches for juveniles and 12 inches for adults. On April 19, 2019, district staff obtained a design variance from NIMS, which allows the jump height in the Fall Creek Fish Ladder to be 12 inches. This variance will reduce the cost of construction and reduce the amount uh, of maintenance needed for the future of the ladder. The district and its consultants are now ready to complete the fish ladder design, obtain permits, bid and construct the fish ladder project. The next step are as follows. One, submit the biological assessment opinion to NIMS for approval and have them consider the revised designs, bypass flows, and proposed maintenance of the fish ladder. Two, acquire all environmental permits based on the 65% design. RDC is under contract to assist the district with these permits. Three, acquire a contract amendment with Waterways Consulting Inc. in the amount of $107 thousand seven hundred sixteen dollars to complete the final one hundred percent plan spec and estimate and perform construction management of the project as detailed on exhibit A. Number four, acquire a contract amen amendment with RDC in the amount of nine thousand six hundred fifteen dollars to include pre-construction and post-construction reports and other tasks. That's exhibit B. And then number five is to bid and construct the project. The following is a compilation of cost estimates and contract amendment proposals necessary to complete the Fall Creek Fish Ladder project. Um, we can read. I could read through those, but they're there in front of you. So the total to complete the Fish Ladder project is $868,215. And it is the recommendation that the Board of Directors review and authorize the district manager to enter into the contract amendments with Water Waste Consulting, Inc., and the Resource Conservation District. Thank you, Rick. Any uh, questions from the board or comment? Bob? Um, on the budget for this, so um, is this, was this budgeted for this year? Well, Creek Fish Letter had a chunk of it budgeted, I think. Part of it's the construction aspect because the not the construction part. I think that will go yeah. next year. Yeah, but there's but the uh, at least the um, down to that, which would be like a hundred and thirty some thousand dollars this year. That was budgeted this year. I know we but I there don't know exactly. Money, but yes, we budgeted money this year. For. How, how much did we budget? And we look at that. Fish ladder. This year's budget had forty thousand dollars in it. This is one of those projects, though, that it's been in the budget every single year, and depending on the timing or what's gone on, the money either has or hasn't been spent. So we're looking at um, a ninety thousand dollar uplift from what we budgeted. So between that and the 
Well, and that's if they're going to spend all of it in this fiscal year. Otherwise, I know we put more money in the fish yeah, ladder. Yeah, for the next year. Yes. Darren, yeah. what, what's this, how long do you think they'll take on this? Well, you know, we're trying to get this thing built this year. So we're going to we're gonna push through um, the, the uh, design, complete the design and the permitting as quickly as we can to try to get it out of the bid probably right around the beginning of the fiscal year. And was this um, amount to um, waterways, was this bid or is this... Um so these, we have an existing contract with waterways to do uh, some of the preliminary designs and get the, the project up to 65%. That's currently under contract. We're, up, we're currently under contract with the RDC to mm -hmm. do uh, some of the preliminary work associated with the permitting process. So what these two are amendments to take those existing contracts and move them through completion of the project. Thank you. And this is the redesign from the six inch stones back to the 12 inch stones. So yeah, back and forth. Um, though, though, although there is light at the end of the tunnel, it appears that we will be getting our permits and for the construction. Is there any grant funding available? We are working on it. I would really hope we can get some. We are this working is, on this it. is an important thing. It, it is an important thing. We need, to, we need to move ahead on it. And we, are, we do have an RFP out for grant writing right now. Uh, so when I first started volunteering, working with the Water District in 2016 as a member of the Environmental Committee, this swim tank was one of the items on the first agenda that I, a meeting that I attended. And I am so happy to see four years later that I can be part of a vote that will get this to completion. So I'm really glad that this is the long drawn out process that all you have gone through. And um, in a short period of time, I can see it. Uh, we're going to have a new fish ladder. And I'm really happy to be part of that. And a new ribbon cutting. Yes, that's what we have. You did say swim tank. You meant Yeah, ladder. I meant fish ladder. I'd say oh. fish. Yeah, I, I get them all big swim. Swim fish. It's all water. It's about fish the same time. Well, we knew what it meant. Yes, thank you. We're just happy just that we're not going to get out and lock up the right. hill anymore. It'll be, a, it'll be a very nice project to get done. And we get a lot of support on the fish ladder. There's a lot of people that go by the fish ladder and yeah. look at it. And, and you and I have talked about this before. I, you know, I know this, the, to me, it's an educational classroom. And we have to make, uh, however the plans get involved in the final design, is that it's accessible to people to see the fish and the pools down below. Mm -hmm. Other questions, comments? Public comment? Yes. I just wanted to say I'm very encouraged because my husband was able to film the um, steelhead spotting in near Henry Powell mm -hmm. Visitor Center when we were there. Mm -hmm. And people have observed the uh, um, steelhead in Hill Creek. So mm -hmm. all the reports are as they're recovering. So it's good. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. And grab the poles. <laughs> <laughs> Any other comments? That'd be nice. Yeah, okay. All right. Are we here to make a motion? No? Okay. okay, I'll make a motion that we uh, review and authorize the well, so uh, authorize the district manager to enter into the contract amendments with Waterways Consulting and the Resource Conservation District. Second. Thank you. Aye. Director Ferris? Aye. Director Falls? Yes. Director Moran? Yes. President Swan? Yes. Director Henry? Aye. All right. All right. <laughs> Item uh, 11A is a, uh, a correspondence to PGE uh, regarding tree removal. It's recommended the board of directors uh, review. Uh, and provide direction regarding the attached letter to PG&E regarding tree removal. At the February 20th, 2020 Environmental Committee meeting during public comment, a request was made on behalf of the Valley Women's Club, Environmental Committee, and Friends of the San Lorenzo Valley of Water to write a letter to PG&E addressing impacts to the watershed by their tree removal program. Uh, they don't believe that PG&E should be removing healthy trees that are environmentally sensitive Instead, they should be replacing uh, 
uh, bare wire with insulated wire and installing high impedance arc fault interrupters as well as employing uh, computerized circuits. This is especially concerning uh, across the district Benlow and Mountain Watershed uh, Empire Grade which has high voltage transmission lines crossing the watershed from downtown Boulder Creek to Empire Grade. Attached is a letter for board review uh, and approval and address to PG&E. It's recommended that the board of directors review um, the letter and give direction. Uh, the, what I put above you is the Empire Grade watershed. Uh, you see the town of Boulder Creek, if I can figure out how I get I can't even work with mine. Um, this is Boulder Creek Elementary School. And as so I went on Google, uh, Bob requested a map. So we went to see what we could find. I went on Google. Here is a, the power lines going up across the district watershed. You can see already that the amount of tree removal. I'm not sure how old this one map is. But you can see the power lines crossing all the way up to Braymore uh, on the district water so so <coughs> Does it come pretty close to our intakes um, uh, or any facilities? Clear Creek and uh, the Foreman Creek is, let's see, you can, here's Foreman Creek, so it doesn't come close to Foreman Creek, but it does go above Clear Creek and Sweetwater, I do believe. Um, so, and it, you know, as you can see, it, it has an impact. I was surprised that it was so I mean, they've, visual. They've already cut, it looks like. Yeah. And, oh, it's been cleared for years. Yeah, yeah and, it, and they're doing more and more cuts. There's no doubt about it. And Are they talking about expanding the cut? Well, That's what I, they keep doing. Uh, I mean, and Nancy Macy's here, and who's probably yeah, um, a pretty good authority on this. Thank you much more for than bringing me. this to the board. This is... Um, a, a huge Sorry. issue, and it's that's actually a transmission line, mm -hmm. and the laws and regulations about that are different than the ones for the distribution lines, and um, what the um, wildfire mitigation plans that PG&E has proposed for the past several years, um, the last this year and the mm -hmm. last year they were uh, required by the legislature to have these plans, and they had previously had their own version of them. They haven't basically changed the concept at all. And the transmission lines are, um, the requirements about that do involve removing the trees, because those are huge lines and they have so much power. So we're not quibbling really with that. What we're quibbling with, and what is extremely important to the water district, is the distribution line. The distribution lines are all the wires that go through the valley everywhere, okay? And um, we are mostly tier three and some tier two utility associated <coughs> high fire danger. Now, people throw away, throw, throw tier three around as if it's just high fire danger, but no, it's high utility associated fire danger. That means it's the utilities infrastructure that is endangering us for fire. And it is the utilities uh, infrastructure that is so poor in these areas that they're having to turn off the power with the PSPS and putting us all in financial distress, no less all the other problems. So what is not happening and what is not being prioritized adequately is they are not replacing the uninsulated single gauge copper wiring of which there is something around 2,700 miles of it in the tier two and tier three areas. Not just here, but all of them. Um, there's 22,000 miles of this. It's, it's like the stuff that was used in, in the 1800s. That's, that's the same wire. And they've got it 22,000 miles throughout their service area. Um, so that's the highest priority, to fix that. The most that PG&E is going to replace this year is 240 miles. Not 2,400 miles, but 240 miles is all they're going to replace. Southern California Edison, which is half the size of PG&E in their service area, is putting it over 700 miles. So it's like PG&E is cutting down trees thinking they're going to protect their wires when their wires are crap. And it's not going to do any good. In fact, it will make things worse for us. We'll have more erosion. 
that will affect our water quality and quantity. We'll have slope instability. It already happened last year. How many of you drove up Bear Creek Road a year ago and were driving through mud as you went up the road? That mud was not normal bad storm erosion mud. That mud came from where they had done the cutting of the trees on Pilcher uh, and all the little uh, creeks going up Bear Creek Road. And that mud came off the hills where the trees had been cut down, huge redwood trees. And if you go up and you look at the wire on Pilcher Creek, it's that single gauge wire. The, the connections are 60 <coughs> years old. And PG&E is cutting down our trees that we need for our property value, for the scenic value, but mostly to protect our property from erosion and these other issues, habitat, not to mention climate change. Um, so PG&E needs to prioritize fixing their own infrastructure. If they put in strengthened insulated wire, and if they included these uh, computerized um, relays, thank you, protective relays, which one example is the high impedance arc fault interrupter, they would have a basically a fail-safe system that it wouldn't matter if a branch fell on the, on the wire because the wire would do like the AT&T wires do. It would be protected enough that it would either go to the ground or if it split, it would stop. It would turn itself off. That's what those arc fault interrupters do. They turn the wire off so it doesn't spark. It doesn't send out streams of, of energy to set things on fire when it falls down. And it actually sends a message back to headquarters and says, this is where, you know, this is where the power outage is. You can come fix it instead of you know, the trucks having to drive up and down the road to find out where the power outage actually is. So this type of equipment needs to be done, it needs to be prioritized. And we have actually talked, we were able to get and talk to President Mary Bell Batcher of the California Public Utilities Commission. She knows this. But the process is so laborious and takes so long. These, they're called proceedings. And it, they are so, um, I have over, in the past year, I've got over 900 emails talking about what's going on with these proceedings, which are uh, to direct what the um, wildfire mitigation plans need to say. But it's really much simpler. So the Water District has the opportunity, because you are directly impacted, and your community is directly impacted by the power being taken by being put up, PSPS, and by the fire danger in the summer, and, it, and by loss of, of, um, of uh, power in the winter. All of that could be alleviated if we had the strengthened insulated wires and these protective relays. So we can look at the letter and make sure it says what, we, what it needs to say, but um, basically that's the concept. You have the you have, you as a water district are going to be more respected than the Little Valley Women's Club, even though we've been working on it for two and a half years, and um, we have done hundreds of hours of research. So you sell yourself short, uh, yeah. I can't see. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, we, we, we yeah. have, we, our voice is heard here. Our voice is heard here. Um, we definitely have the support of the supervisors. They actually became a party to the proceedings and put in extraordinarily well-written, extremely well-researched uh, application to be a party to the proceedings. And um, it looks like they're going to put in some more information this year. But um, it's, it's, a, it's so frustrating because the CPUC is so stuck in their way of doing things that they can't see the forest for the trees. You know, they're willing to let PG&E make the decision to cut down millions of trees in their service area without even having proven that it's going to work. The California Public Utilities Commission has a thing called the Office of, of um, 
uh, no, Office of Safety Advocates. And what the safety, Office of Safety Advocates was, it no longer exists, but that's another story, uh, was to make sure that PG needed everything related to safety properly. And they looked at this plan to cut down all these trees and said, you haven't shown any, any measurements, any, any information that proves that it's going to work. How do you know it's going to work? So anyway, I don't want to take up any more of your time, but they're ignoring their own Office of Safety Africa. They approved it anyway. They're letting PG&E make the decisions <coughs> instead of making the decisions themselves. So the letter goes to the governor. It goes to the, our legislators local and state. It goes to President Mary Bell Batcher of the Public Utilities Commission, and it goes to the other commissioners. And the letter is, this water district is surrounded by tier three areas, and they're planning on cutting down thousands of trees, thousands of trees, along and under the wires. And if you drive up to Bar Road, and you get to where the creek's right down there, long, long slope down, and there are redwood trees on that side of the road. Everyone has the X of death on them. Every one of them. It's hundreds of them. You go up Bear Creek Road, up, go up West Park Drive. All those huge trees that are along the edge of the road there that go down to the creek have the X of death on them because they're going to cut them down. So we have to prevent that from happening. It will totally decimate our creeks and our waterways and your inputs, and it's just going to be awful. So um, they started with the private property last year, and those people, that's why we got involved. We have literally helped dozens of people protect their property so they could say no. You get to cut a four-inch radial around the wire, that's the law. Because that's going to protect the wire from whipping the branches and stuff. But you don't get to cut down my whole redwood tree or my whole oak tree or whatever the kind of tree it is. And I've got a lot of stories to tell you where they did cut them down and it caused a lot of problems. So Paradise is one of the stories. And that is where they had cut down the wires, they had cut down the trees, around the wires, as they had planned to do here, and those made wind tunnels that allowed the fire brands to be blown way past where the fire had started, way past where the fire was. And it went through those wind tunnels and those fire brands came slamming into houses and those neighborhoods burned up and none of the trees around those neighborhoods were burned. They've got dozens of pictures from Paradise showing that. And if they create these tree tunnels for us, we're going to have that same problem. So we've got the fire districts <coughs> writing letters. We're hoping that you will do the same. Wait, Let me know if I can help. Well, I, I think I'm confused um, about what the ask is. But now, yeah, was, we'll this, have this. was this something that the Environmental <coughs> Committee, I couldn't, I couldn't, there's been a tent that he posted yet, so I wasn't able to see. Was this something the Environmental Committee's uh, approved? It was, it, it was brought up in during oral communications by the okay. um, member. Because, so it wasn't discussed, it was just read. Oh, after okay. hearing, after hearing what you said, yeah. um, and there's a lot of great information in there that I think, plus the impacts on us as a district from a monetary point of view, mm -hmm. I think there's a lot more information that we need to put in the letter. <clears throat> and is the impression that there was an urgency to this? Is there? Is, is this there? something that the committee well, can Well, um, they're on? going to be approving the current plan um, uh, by the by the first of April. Okay. So, so you've got then time. we have more time. But I, yeah. I was under the impression from well, the I mean, I, really yeah, yeah, it's, it's urgent in or, that we don't want to go another year. Yeah, no, I get that. <laughs> yeah. 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 The other thing is I'm. You know, I know technology changes rapidly, and I, I think there's a way of being able to say that PG&E should use 
the best practices that exactly. are available in the that's, utility. That's the terminology we'd like to use. Without really. necessarily, because I'm not a high voltage mm -hmm. expert, so I don't exactly know what right. to say the solution is, but I'm sure there are best practices out there that could be done. Is, is this something that the Environmental Committee could take on as, and come back? I mean, I, I think there's good. I mean, I, I was under the impression there was an urgency, and I was given a couple of letters to, to use as kind of a trap. And um, have you guys met already this month? No, we have not discussed this. Uh, this has not been agendized on the environment. Yeah. Okay. Because I, I, I just think that this, and then on the height, on those, on those lines, is there anything we can do about that in terms of them cutting trees down on that parcel, or is that not well, possible? Because that, that's that's through our watershed. That's really that's through our watershed. Plus, watershed when they, they cut those trees down, obviously they, they just buck them up or brush them up and leave them in place. Yeah. yeah. I mean, they're not cutting more trees there. They're just maintaining. They're, they're, maintain. they're maintaining now. I mean, that's been cut like that for years. I'm not really, I'm not really sure. It's definitely a wind tunnel. I mean, yeah. yeah. Well, but, I mean, we can't do anything about that, I don't think, right? No, we can't do anything. So, I mean, but that's what's talked about in the letters. I'm right. talking about confused. Yeah. talked about insulating wire and so forth okay, but through those areas. Mm -hmm. Okay, but I didn't get that when I read through this yeah. as much. There was a... And we could, we could if, if there's not an urgency, no problem taking it back and, and re And I'd be more than happy to, to come and, and uh, at the environmental credit. Because I, I think talking I was about the impression there was urgency. Talking about the, the financial talking about the financial impacts, being very clear about <clears throat> the fact that we don't want that to expand. Right. Right. Um, and to use best practices and then um, the distribution lines. Yeah, I mean the Yeah. So I mean, the those, environmental yeah. Well, I think if at least uh, the environmental planner should look at this and have her input so it, it's a letter from the <laughs> water district. So right. it has okay, well, the water district's interest. Yeah, well, uh, that's that's what be from yeah no, that it needs to be. In fact, you, there was actually a letter written um, a year ago, and it, uh, but it only talked about um, not cutting down as many trees. Right. And it, what it we wasn't do, very specific. Yeah, well, we My interests are financial, don't expand, um, and uh, in terms of the impact on the community, upgrade your system. I mean, yeah. I get the environmental planner to work with me. I see on, on another letter or on a, a different subject. I mean, if that's, yeah. if that's what the board of direction is, that's, yeah. that's, that's what I'm looking for. Is right? that something that, that, that goes to the environmental yeah. committee? It's on the agenda. It's on the yeah. agenda? Yeah. 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 Let's put it on the agenda. Let's do that. Well, here's the thing about the agenda, boys and girls, and as I remember, is we set out some priorities and we want to keep on those priorities. And, um, and sometimes things yes. come up. Exactly. <laughs> but th this will be a, an easy lift because we can get most of it done with the environmental planner and exactly that's and what Nancy and Brent for approval for you to kick it up. Sure. As long as there's not a, a big urgency. Because does, this, does the letter have to be in before April 1st? Yes. Yeah, so I mean, that's yeah. not really going to work. That's timeline wise. But I mean, the letter. Oh, yeah, this is March already. I'm sorry, I don't even know what month it is. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's that won't work very well. Yeah, that, okay, well then it, the it's what? it's not gonna. They're gonna probably approve the current plan the way it is, but um, if they get a letter in 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 the month of April, that still could impact what PG&E actually yeah, carries. Right. So yeah. I, I'm. I we'll move like on it and try it. to get it out as quick as possible. Yeah. I, mean, I have a feeling that if they're only putting in 240 miles. miles but we probably aren't we're not on the that highest list. priority. <laughs> no, but we're on the list of having 2,000 trees cut down. Yeah. More. Oh, one last little figure um, <laughs> that makes it even more worrisome. We're talking about the PG&E right way. Well, PG&E just got, um, two years ago, they got permits from CAL FIRE. Uh, it's called um, an exemption so that they don't have to put in a timber harvest plan. And they got permits to cut down trees as much as 200 feet from their wires. Wow. And guess where that is? That's on our private property. 
that they get to cut down. They can come on my property and they can cut down a tree that's 200 feet off their right of way. And if they declare that tree, a, a, you know, it's going to fall on their wire. It's within falling distance. They can cut it down. Sounds like an injunction. And that's to be done. $500 Bill five hundred million dollars in one year. That's what they're going to spend on. You you can't keep them off your property. I they would. I have them. I have the guts and the knowledge to say no. You're not going to cut down right. that tree. Go ahead and hold me liable. Yeah. Yeah. The falls. They'd have trouble with me too. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> okay. Okay. So yeah, direction. Yeah, I want to have uh, Carly reach out to Nancy and Macy and get this and get this back to the environmental committee. I have I have some comments to make, um, kind of in line with what Bob was was saying. I didn't make it to the last environmental committee meeting because I was sick. I apologize, or I would have made these comments then. But you know, we're trying to conjole and and work with PG&E. It oh, strikes yeah. me. So you have to be careful how you message. Oh yeah, no, right. You know, and so careful. towards that end, I agree with the spirit of, right. of the letter. But I have two, two, two things that kind of bother me. One is that we simply imply that if we stop cutting down healthy trees and replace it with high impedance arc fault and interrupters, that solves the problem. I don't think so. For example, um, <laughs> there are possible legitimate reasons why you want to cut down a healthy tree. You know, you mentioned the, the PG&E notified um, actual private landowners last year. I was one of them. They contacted me. They wanted to cut down a tree a bay that was right we our land abuts to highway nine mm -hmm. and so i made a appointment with it the, with their arborist we went down and looked at the tree and the tree was leaning at a yeah. very exaggerated angle over highway nine that's it not only would have taken out the wire it would have taken out any car that was coming by right so i for you know in my mind that's why i would call an imminent public health <coughs> danger yeah. that is that just not, adds to well, not, but i'm just saying we, we need to kind of acknowledge sure that that that, that, that you know, that's not what we're talking about what we're talking about Good is idea. cutting down uh, healthy trees where you don't need to cut down healthy Very trees possible. because I, I think we are I think they are planning a way over doing it so I actually approve it because it was the right thing to do mm -hmm. not not only for the, the knocking down the wire but also but potentially hitting water we wouldn't react very well to that. I think we'd get defensive. So we need to keep that in mind as we're trying to talk to the, the person that we're looking for um, to work with. So I, therefore I would recommend putting in a statement something to the effect of you know, we're going to suggest that we work with PG&E <laughs> to fully investigate alternatives based on sound, comprehensive risk-benefit studies that minimize the, the, the impact of trees. Something. And ironically enough, Southern California Edison did one of those. And they came up with the fact that they needed to fix their wires, and they committed the money to do it a whole lot faster than PG&E. Oh, so I'm, that's, that's I'm all for that. That would be great. I just don't want to delay it anymore. Yeah. I think you need to call public comment. Yeah, any uh, public comment on this? Bruce. Uh, I just want to say something about uh, paragraph three in your letter. Um, it refers to um, it refers to endangered salmonids, and I think um, endangered is sort of a term of art. There's a certain thing called an endangered species, and I think there's a federal agency that's in charge of all these things. You, you, you can talk whenever you want. You want to go first? No. Uh, I'm the, okay. I, it's hard for me to talk when I keep hearing this thing in my head. Okay. Um, okay, so using the word endangered, I'm afraid that it might be the wrong word because um, I think steelhead are threatened, maybe. I, I'd have to research this. Uh, coho salmon, the, the, it says juvenile salmon in the very last sentence. Um, the kind of salmon that you're talking about are coho salmon, as I understand it. I don't think there are any other kind of salmon that have ever, in recent history, been in the San Lorenzo River or in the whole San Lorenzo watershed. But at this point, the coho salmon have been extirpated for at least 10 years from the San Lorenzo, the entire San Lorenzo River watershed. Um, so if you refer to 
success rates of juvenile salmon in the San Lorenzo River watershed, to me that sounds like you don't know what's happened in the last 10 years. I'm sorry to say there are no coho here. It, it has happened in our lifetime, probably due to our activities. Um, but I don't see that there's any easy way to go back. It's not like the coho are going to spontaneously generate in the watershed. Uh, they do exist in Laguna Creek, which is over in Bonnydin, over, over the ridge, you know, on the other side of Empire Gray. So, you, you know, and I, I just want to say that um, recently I, I read an article in the newspaper, I can't remember when it was, maybe in the last year, it might have been talking about the large woody debris project, but it made similar comments about coho salmon as if they still exist here, as if the large woody debris project might do some good for coho salmon, and it would if they were here, but they're not. And so I guess I want to encourage people to acknowledge that there are no salmon in the whole San Lorenzo River watershed. Bruce, any other public comment? Okay. Okay. All right. So we've got uh, directions. We're going to go to the Environmental Committee. Yes. Uh, next up, the consent agenda. Does anybody need to want anything pulled from the minutes of February 20th? No. Not hearing any? Okay. Motion to accept the consent agenda. There's no written communication, no informal material. I think that's uh, like part. Go ahead. And you want to say something? You're dying to say something. Did you make a motion for the consent, or you just? I made a motion. Did I make a motion? We don't need one. Yeah, we don't need one. I wasn't sure. Okay. Anything else? Yes. Everybody eat cookies. Save the staff. There's plenty of them in the kitchen still. I like cookies. I buy a lot of cookies.